Welcome to the Folktale Project. This is Dan Scholes. This week on the podcast, during our July vacation, I'm bringing you the story of Waverly as retold in Red Cap Tales. This is one of my favorite books so far because I'd never read Waverly before and I found the whole story rather fascinating. And I hope that you enjoy it as well. This is Waverly. Four children would not read Scott, so I told them these stories and others to lure them to the printed book much as carrots are dangled before the nose of a reluctant donkey. They are four average intelligent children enough, but they hold severely modern views upon storybooks. Waverly, in especial, they could not away with. They found themselves stuck upon the very threshold. Now, since the first telling of these red cap tales, the Scott shelf in the library has been taken by storm and escalade. It is permanently gap-toothed all along the line. There are also nightly skirmishes, even to the laying on of hands as to who shall sleep with Waverly under his pillow. It struck me that there must be many oldsters in the world who, for the sake of their own youth, would like the various sweethearts who now inhabit their nurseries to read Sir Walter with the same breathless eagerness as they used to do, how many years agone. It is chiefly for their sakes that I have added several interludes, telling how Sweetheart, Hugh John, Sir Toady Lion, and Maid Margaret received my petty larcenies from the full chest of the wizard. At any rate, Red Cap succeeded in one case. Why should it not in another? I claim no merit in the telling of the tales, save that, like medicines well sugar-coated, the patients mistook them for candies and asked for more. The books are open. Anyone can tell Scott's stories over again in his own way. This is mine. Samuel Rutherford Crockett It was all Sweetheart's fault, and this is how it came about. She and I were at Dryburgh Abbey, sitting quietly on a rustic seat and looking toward the aisle in which slept the great dead. The long expected had happened, and we had made pilgrimage to our Mecca. Yet, in spite of the still beauty of the June day, I could see that a shadow lay upon our sweetheart's brow. Oh, I know he was great, she burst out at last, and what you read me out of the life was nice. I like hearing about Sir Walter, but... I knew what was coming. But what, I said, looking severely at the ground so that I might be able to harden my heart against the pathos of Sweetheart's expression. But I can't read the novels. Indeed, I can't. I've tried Waverley at least twenty times. And as for Rob Roy... Even the multiplication table failed here, and at this, variously a sprawl on the turf beneath, the smaller fry giggled. Course said Hugh John, who was engaged in eating grass like an ox. We know it's true about Rob Roy. She read us one whole volume, and there wasn't no Rob Roy nor any fighting in it, so we pelted her with fur cones to make her stop and read over Treasure Island to us instead. Yes, though we had heard it twenty times already, commented Sir Toady Lion, trying his hardest to pinch his brother's legs on the sly. Books without pictures is silly said a certain maid Margaret, a companion new to the honorable company, who was weaving daisy chains, her legs crossed beneath her Turk fashion. In literature she had got as far as words of one syllable, and had a poor opinion even of them. I had read all Scott's novels long before I was your age, I said reprovingly. The children received this announcement with the cautious silence with which every rising generation listens to the experiences of its elders when retailed by way of odious comparison. "Mm Mm-hmm, said Sir Toady, the licensed in speech. We know all that. Oh, yes, and you didn't like fruit, and you liked medicine and a big spoon, and eating porridge, and... Oh, we know, we know, cried all the others in chorus whereupon I informed them what would have happened to us thirty years ago if we had ventured to address our parents in such a fashion. But, sweetheart, with the gravity of her age upon her, endeavored to raise the discussion to its proper level. Scott writes such a lot before you get at the story, she objected, knitting her brows. Why couldn't he have just begun right away? 
with Squire Trelawney and Dr. Livesey drawing at their pipes in the oak-paneled dining room and Black Dog outside the door and Pew come tapping along the road with his stick, cried Hugh John, turning off a sketchy synopsis of his favorite situations in fiction. Now that's what I call a proper book, said Sir Toady, hastily rolling himself out of the way of being kicked. For with these unusual children, the smooth, ordinary upper surfaces of life covered a constant succession of private wars and rumors of wars, which went on under the table at meals, in the schoolroom, and even, it is whispered, in church. As for blithe maid Margaret, she said nothing, for she was engaged in testing the capacities of a green slope of turf for turning somersaults upon. In Sir Walter Scott's time, I resumed gravely, Novels were not written for little girls. Then why did you give us Miss Edgeworth to read? said Sweetheart quickly. But I went on without noticing the interruption. Now, if you like, I will tell you some of Sir Walter's stories over again, and then I will mark in your own little edition the chapters you can read for yourselves. The last clause quieted the joyous shout which the promise of a story, any sort of a story, had called forth. An uncertain look crept over their faces, as if they scented afar off that abomination of desolation, lessons in holiday time. "'Must we read the chapters?' said Hugh John unhopefully. "'Tell us the stories anyway, and leave it to our honor," suggested Sir Toady Lion with a twinkle in his eye. "'Oh, it's a story, or oh, don't begin without me!' Maid Margaret called from behind the trees, her sturdy five-year-old legs carrying her to the scene of action so fast that her hat fell off on the grass and she had to turn back for it. Well, I will tell you, if I can, the story of Waverley, I said. Was he called after the pens? said Toady Lyon, the irreverent, but under his breath. He was, however, promptly kicked into silence by his peers, seriously this time, for he who interferes with the telling of a story is a whelk, which for the moment, is the family word for whatever is base, mean, unprofitable, and unworthy of being associated with. But first I told them about the writing of Waverley, and the hand at the Edinburgh back window which wrote and wrote. Only that but the story as told by Lockhart had affected my imagination as a boy. Did you ever hear of the unworried hand? I asked them. It sounds a nice title, said Sir Toady. Had he only one? It was in the early summer weather of 1814, I began, after a dinner in a house on George Street that a young man, sitting at the wine with his companions, looked out the window and, turning pale, asked his next neighbor to change seats with him. There it is, at it again, he said, with a thump of his fist on the table that made the decanters jump and clatter the glasses. It has haunted me every night these three weeks. Just when I am lifting my glass, I look through the window, and there it is, at it, writing. Writing, always writing. So the young men, pressing about, looked eagerly, and lo, seen through the back window of a house in a street built at right angles, they saw the shape of a man's hand writing swiftly, steadily, on large quarto papers. As soon as one was finished, it was added to a pile which grew and grew, rising, as it were, visibly before their eyes. It goes on like that all the time, even after the candles are lit, said the young man, and it makes me ashamed. I get no peace for it when I am not at my books. Why cannot the man do his work without making others uncomfortable? Perhaps some of the company may have thought it was not a man at all, but some imprisoned fairy tied to an endless task. Wizard Michael's familiar spirit, or Lord Solus's imp Redcap doing his master's bidding with a goose quill. But it was something much more wonderful than any of these. It was the hand of Walter Scott, finishing Waverley, at the rate of a volume every ten days. Why did he work so hard? demanded Hugh John, whom the appearance of fifty hands diligently writing would not have annoyed. No, not if they had all worked like sewing machines. Because, I answered, the man who rode Waverley was beginning to have more need of money. He had bought land, he was involved in other people's misfortunes. Besides, for a long time he had been a great poet, and now of late there had arisen a greater. I know, cried Sweetheart. Lord Byron. But I don't think he was. Anyway, Fitzjames and Roderick Dew is ripping, announced Hugh John. Rising to his feet, he whistled shrill in imitation of the outlaw. It was the time to take the affairs of children at the fullness of the tide. I think, I ventured, that you would like the story of Waverley if I were to tell it now. I know you will like Rob Roy, which will be first. Then, 
There were countercries of Waverley and Rob Roy, all the fury of a contested election, but Sweetheart, waiting till the brawlers were somewhat breathed, indicated the final sense of the meeting by saying quietly, Tell us the one the hand was writing. Edward Waverley found his regiment quartered at Dundee in Scotland, but, the time being winter and the people of the neighborhood not very fond of the red soldiers, he did not enjoy the soldiering life so much as he had expected. So, as soon as the summer was fairly come, he asked permission to visit the castle of Bradwardine, in order to pay his respects to his uncle's friend. It was noon of the second day after setting out when Edward Waverley arrived at the village of Tully Valen, to which he was bound. Never before had he seen such a place, for, at his uncle's house of Waverley Honour, the houses of villagers, all white and neat, stood about a village green, or lurked ancient and ivy-grown under the shade of great old park trees. But the turf-roofed hovels of Tully Vale, and with their low doors, supported on either side by all too intimate piles of peat and rubbish, appeared to the young Englishman hardly fit for human beings to live in. Indeed, from the hordes of wretched curs which barked after the heels of his horse, Edward might have supposed them meant to serve as kennels. That is, save for the ragged urchins who sprawled in the mud of the road and the old women who, distaff in hand, dashed out to rescue them from being trampled upon by Edward's charger. Passing gardens as full of nettles as of potherbs and entering between a couple of gateposts, each crowned by the image of a rampant bear, the young soldier at last saw before him at the end of an avenue the steep roofs and crow-steeped gable ends of Bradwardine, half-dwelling house, half-castle. Here, Waverley dismounted, and giving his horse to the soldier-servant who had accompanied him, he entered a court in which no sound was to be heard save the splashing of a fountain. He saw the door of a tall old mansion before him. Going up, he raised the knocker, and instantly the echoes resounded through the empty house, but no one came to answer. The castle appeared uninhabited, the court a desert. Edward glanced about him, half expecting to be hailed by some ogre or giant as adventurers used to be in the fairy tales he had read in childhood. But instead, he only saw all sorts of bears, big and little, climbing as it seemed on the roof, over the windows and out upon the ends of the gables, while over the door at which he had been vainly knocking he read in antique lettering the motto, Beware the Bear. But all these Bruins were of stone and each one of them kept as still and silent as did everything else about this strange mansion, except, that is, the fountain, which behind him in the court kept up its noisy splashing. Feeling somehow vaguely uncomfortable, Edward Waverley crossed the court into a garden, green and pleasant, but to the full as solitary as the castle court. Here again he found more bears, all sitting up in rows on their haunches on parapets and along terraces as if engaged in looking at the view. He wandered up and down, searching for someone to whom to speak, and had almost made up his mind they had found a real enchanted castle of silence, when, in the distance, he saw a figure approaching up one of the green walks. There was something uncouth and strange about the way the newcomer kept waving his hands over his head. Then, for no apparent reason, flapping them across his breast like a groom on a frosty day, hopping all the time, first on one foot and then on the other. Tiring of this way of getting over the ground, he would advance by standing leaps, keeping both feet together. The only thing he seemed quite incapable of doing was to use his feet, one after the other, as ordinary people do when they are walking. Indeed, this strange guardian of the enchanted castle of Bradwardine looked like a gnome or a fairy dwarf for he was clad in an old-fashioned dress of grey, slashed with scarlet. On his legs were scarlet stockings, and on his head a scarlet cap, which in turn was surmounted with a turkey's feather. He came along, dancing and singing in jerks and snatches, till suddenly, looking up from the ground, he saw Edward. In an instant his red cap was off, and he was bowing and saluting and again saluting and bowing, with, if possible, still more extravagant gestures than before. Edward asked this curious creature if the Baron Bradwardine were at home, and what was his astonishment to be instantly answered in rhyme. The knights to the mountain, his bugle to wind, the ladies to greenwood, her garlands to bind, the bower of Bird Ellen, heard moss on the floor, that the step of Lord William be silent and sure. This was impressive enough, surely, but after all it did not tell the young captain what he wanted to know. So he continued to question the strange white, and finally... 
after eliciting many unintelligible sounds, was able to make out the single word, butler. Bouncing upon this, Edward commanded the unknown to lead him instantly to the butler. Nothing loath, the fool danced and capered on in front, and at a turning of the path they found an old man, who seemed by his dress to be half butler, half gardener, digging diligently among the flower beds. Upon seeing Captain Waverley, he let drop his spade, undid his green apron, frowning all the time at Edward's guide for bringing his master's guest upon him without warning, to find him digging in the earth like a common laborer. But the Bradwardine butler had an explanation ready. His honor was with the folk, getting down the black hag, so he confided to Edward. The two gardener lads had been ordered to attend his honor, so, in order to amuse himself, he, the major duomo of Bradwardine, had been amusing himself with dressing Miss Rose's flower beds. It was but seldom that he found time for such like, though personally he was very fond of garden work. He cannot get it rot in more than two days a week, at no rate whatever, put in the scarecrow and the red cap and the turkey feather. Go instantly and find his honor at the black hag, cried the major domo of Bradwardine, wrathful at his interference, and tell him there is a gentleman come from England waiting for him in the hall. Can this poor fellow deliver a letter? Edward asked doubtfully. With all fidelity, sir, said the butler, that is, to any one whom he respects. After all, he is more knave than fool. We call the innocent Davy Doolittle, though his proper name is Davy Gelatley. But the truth is that since my young mistress, Miss Rose Bradwardine, took a fancy to dress him up in fine clothes, the creature cannot be got to do a single hand's turn of work. But here comes Miss Rose herself. Glad will she be to welcome one of the name of Waverley to her father's house. On a certain Sunday evening, toward the middle of the eighteenth century, a young man stood practicing the guards of the broadsword in the library of an old English manor house. The young man was Captain Edward Waverley, recently assigned to the command of a company in Gardiner's Regiment of Dragoons, and his uncle was coming in to say a few words to him before he set out to join the colors. Being a soldier and a hero, Edward Waverley was naturally tall and handsome, but, owing to the manner of his education, his uncle, a high Jacobite of the old school, held that he was somewhat too bookish for a proper man. He must therefore see a little of the world, asserted old Sir Everard. His aunt Rachel had another reason for wishing him to leave Waverley Honour. She had actually observed her Edward look too often across at the squire's pew in church. Now, Aunt Rachel held it no wrong to look at Squire Stubbs's pew if only that pew had been empty, but it was, a oh, wickedness, just when it contained the dear old-fashioned sprigged gown and the fresh pretty face of Miss Cecilia Stubbs that Aunt Rachel's nephew looked most often in that direction, in addition to which the old lady was sure she had observed that little Seely Stubbs glance over at her handsome Edward in a way that, well, when she was young. And here the old lady bridled and tossed her head in the words which her lips formed themselves to utter, though she was too ladylike to speak them, were obviously the minx. Hence it was clear to the most simple and unprejudiced that a greater distance had better be put between the Waverley Loft and the Squire's pew, and that as soon as possible. Edward's uncle, Sir Everard, had wished him to travel abroad in company with his tutor, a staunch Jacobite clergyman by the name of Mr. Pembroke, but to this Edward's father, who was a member of the government, unexpectedly refused his sanction. Now, Sir Everard despised his younger brother as a turncoat, and indeed something little better than a spy, but he could not gainsay a father's authority, even though he himself had brought the boy up to be his heir. I am willing that you should be a soldier, he said to Edward. Your ancestors have always been of that profession. Be brave like them, but not rash. Remember, you are the last of the Waverleys and the hope of the house. Keep no company with gamblers, with rakes, or with wigs. Do your duty to God, to the Church of England, and, he was going to say to the king, when he remembered that by his father's wish, Edward is going to fight the battles of King George. So, the old Jacobite finished off rather lamely by repeating, To the Church of England and all constituted authorities. Then the old man, not trusting himself to say more, broke off abruptly and went down to the stables to choose the horses which were to carry Edward to the north. Finally, 
he delivered into the hands of his nephew an important letter addressed as follows. To Cosmo Common Bradwardine, Esquire of Bradwardine, at his principal mansion of Tully Vale in Perthshire, North Britain. These, for that was the dignified way in which men of rank directed their letters in those days. The leave-taking of Mr. Pembroke, Edward's tutor, was even longer and more solemn, and had Edward attended in the least to his moralizings, he might have felt somewhat depressed. In conclusion, the good clergyman presented him with several pounds of fool's cap, closely written in a neat hand. These, he said, handling the sheets reverently, are purposely written small that they may be convenient to keep by you in your saddlebags. They are my works, my unpublished works. They will teach you the real fundamental principles of the church, principles concerning which while you have been my pupil I have been under obligation never to speak to you. But now, as you read them, I doubt not but that the light will come upon you. At all events, I have cleared my conscience. Edward, in the quiet of his chamber, glanced at the heading of the first. A descent from dissenters, or the comprehension confuted. He felt the weight and thickness of the manuscript, and promptly confuted their author by consigning the package to that particular corner of his traveling trunk where he was least likely to come across it again. On the other hand, his Aunt Rachel warned him with many head-shakings against the forwardness of the ladies whom he would meet with in Scotland, where she had never been. Then, more practically, she put into his hand a purse of broad gold pieces and set on his finger a noble diamond ring. As for Miss Seely Stubbs, she came to the Waverley Church on the last day before his departure, arrayed in all her best and newest clothes, mighty fine with hoops, patches, and silks everywhere. But Master Edward, who had put his uniform on for the first time, his gold-laced hat beside him on the cushion, his broadsword by his side, and his spurs on his heels, hardly once looked at the squire's pew, at which neglect little Seely pouted somewhat at the time. But, since within six months she was married to Jones, the steward's son at Waverley Honor, with whom she lived happily ever after, we may take it that her heart could not have been very deeply touched by Edward's inconstancy. Rose Bradwardine was still quite young. Scarce did the tale of her years number seventeen, but already she was noted all over the countryside as a pretty girl, with a skin like snow and hair that glistened like pale gold when the light fell upon it. Living so far from society, she was naturally not a little shy, but as soon as her first feeling of bashfulness was over, Rose spoke freely and brightly. Edward and she, however, had but little time to be alone together, for it was not long before the Baron of Bradwardine appeared, striding toward them as if he had possessed himself of the giant's seven-league boots. Bradwardine was a tall, thin, soldierly man, who, in his time, had seen much of the world, and who under a hard and even stern exterior, hid a naturally warm heart. He was much given to the singing of French songs, and to making long and learned Latin quotations, and indeed he quoted Latin, even with the tears standing in his eyes as he first shook Edward by the hand, and then embraced him in the foreign fashion on both cheeks, all to express the immense pleasure it was to receive in his house of Tully Vailen a worthy scion of the old stock of Waverley Honour. While Miss Rose ran off to make some changes in her dress, the baron conducted Edward into a hall hung about with pikes and armour. Four or five servants in old-fashioned livery received them with honour, the major duomo at their head. The butler gardener was not to be caught napping a second time. Bradwardine took Captain Waverley at once into an old dining-room all panelled with black oak, round the walls of which hung pictures of former chiefs of the line of Tully Valen. Somewhere out of doors a bell was ringing to announce the arrival of other guests, and Edward observed with some interest that the table was laid for six people. In such a desolate country it seemed difficult to imagine where they would arrive from. Upon this point Edward soon received enlightenment. First there was the Laird of Balmawapple, a discreet young gentleman, said the Baron, much given to field sports. Next came the Laird of Killinkirat, who cultivated his own fields and cared for his own cattle, thereby, quoth the Baron, showing the commonness of his origin. Added to these were a non-juring Episcopal minister, that is, one who had refused to take the oath of allegiance to King George's government, and last, 
of all, the Baron Bailey, or land steward of Bridewardine, one Mr. Wackweeble. This last, to show his consciousness of his inferior position, seated himself as far as possible from the table, and as often as he wanted to eat he bent himself nearly double over his plate, in the shape of a clasped knife about to shut. When dinner was over, Rose and the clergyman discreetly retired, when, with a sign to the butler, the Baron of Bradwardine produced out of a locked case a golden cup, called the Blessed Bear of Bradwardine, in which burst the host, and then all the company pledged the health of the young English stranger. After a while, the Baron and Edward set out to see their guests a certain distance on their way, going with them down the avenue to the village change-house, or inn, where Balmawapple and Killingcurate had stabled their horses. Edward, being weary, would much rather have found himself in bed, but this desertion of good company the Baron would no ways allow. So, under the low cobwebbed roof of Lucky McClary's kitchen, the four gentlemen sat down to taste the sweets of the night. But it was not long before the wine began to do its work in their heads. Each one of them, Edward excepted, talked or sang without paying any attention to his fellows. From wine they fell to politics, when Bamoapple proposed a toast which was meant to put an affront to the uniform Edward wore, and the king in whose army he served. To the little gentleman in black velvet, cried the young lad, he who did such service in 1702 and may the white horse break his neck over a mound of his making. The little gentleman in black velvet was the mole over whose hillock King William's horse is said to have stumbled while the white horse represented the house of Hanover. Though of a Jacobite family, Edward could not help taking offence at the obvious insult, but the baron was before him. The quarrel was not his, he assured him. The guest's quarrel was the host's, so long as he remained under his roof. Here, quoth the baron, I am in loco parentis to you, Captain Waverley. I am bound to see you scatheless. And as for you, Mr. Falconer of Bamoapple, I warn you to let me see no more aberrations from the paths of good manners. And I tell you, Mr. Cosmo, common Bradwardine of Bradwardine and Tully Valen, retorted the other in huge disdain, that I will make a mere cock of the man that refuses my toast, whether he be a crop-eared English wig with a black ribbon around his lug, or any who deserts his friends to claw favor with rats of Hanover. In an instant, rapiers were out, and the baron and Bamoapple hard at it. The younger man was stout and active, but he was no match for the baron at the sword-play, and the encounter would not have lasted long had not the landlady, Lucky McClary, hearing the well-known clash of swords, come running in on them, crying that surely the gentleman would not bring dishonor on an honest wood woman's house when there was all the Leland in the country to do their fighting upon. So saying, she stopped the combat very effectually by flinging her plaid over the weapons of the adversaries. Next morning, Edward awoke late, and in no happy frame of mind. It was an age of duels, and with his first waking thoughts there came the memory of the insult which had been passed upon him by the laird of Bamoapple. His position, as an officer, and a Waverley, left him no alternative but to send that sportsman a challenge. Upon descending, he found Rose Bradwardine presiding at the breakfast table. She was alone, but Edward felt in no mood for conversation and sat gloomy, silent and ill-content with himself and with circumstances. Suddenly, he saw the Baron and Bamoapple pass the window arm in arm, and the next moment the butler summoned him to speak with his master in another apartment. There he found Bamoapple, no little sulky and altogether silent with the Baron by his side. The latter, in his capacity as mediator, made Edward a full and complete apology for the events of the past evening, an apology which the young man gladly accepted along with the hand of the offender, somewhat stiffly given, it is true, owing to the necessity of carrying his right arm in a sling, the result, as Bamoapple afterwards assured Miss Rose, of a fall from his horse. It was not till the morning of the second day that Edward learned the whole history of this reconciliation, which had at first been so welcome to him. It was daft Davy Gelatley, who, by the way of a roguish singing of a ballad, first roused his suspicions that something underlay Bamoapple's professions of regret for his conduct. The young man will brawl at the evening board, heard you so merry the little bird sing, but the old man will draw at the dawning his sword, and the thistlecock's head is under his wing. 
Edward could see by the sly looks of the fool that he meant something personal by this, so he plied the butler with questions and discovered that the baron had actually fought Famo Apple on the morning after the insult and wounded him in the sword arm. Here, then, was the secret of the young laird's unexpected submission and apology. As Davy Gelatly put it, Famo Apple had been sent home with his boots full of blood. The tale-telling had at this point to be broken off. Clouds began to spin themselves on Eldian top. Dinner was also in a prospect, and most of all, having heard so much of the tale, the four listeners decided to begin to play Waverley. Sweetheart made a stately if skirted Bradwardine. Besides, she was in Caesar, and had store of Latin quotations, mostly, it is true, from the examples in the grammar, such as Illa indicit regina. Certainly, she walked like a queen. Or, as it might be expressed more fittingly with the character of the baron in the original, stately stepped she east the way and stately stepped she west. Hugh John considered the hero's part in any story only his due. His only fault with that of Waverley was that he had so far done so little. He specially resented the terrible combat in the dawning between the Baron and the overbold Bamo Apple, played by Maid Margaret, Sir Toady Lyon as low comedian, Chameleon, he called it, performed numerous antics as dashed Davy Gelatly, he had dressed the part to perfection by putting his striped jersey on outside his coat and sticking in his cricket cap such feathers as he could find. Lie down, Hugh John, he cried in the middle of his dancing and singing round and round the combatants. Why, you are asleep in bed. This, according to the authorities, being obvious, the baffled hero had to succumb, with the muttered reflection that Jim Hawkins wouldn't have had to stay asleep when he heard a fight like that going on. Still, however, Hugh John could not restrain the natural rights of criticism. He continually raised his head from his pillow of dried branches to watch Sweetheart and Maid Margaret. You fight just like girls, he cried indignantly. Keep your left hand behind you, Bradwardine, or Bamawapple will hack it off. I say, girls are silly things. You two are afraid of hurting each other, now me and Toady Lion. And he gave details of a late fraternal combat, much in the manner of Foissant. It is to be noted that thus far both Sweetheart and Maid Margaret disdained the female parts, the latter even going the length of saying that she preferred Seely Stubbs, the squire's daughter at Waverley Honor, to Rose Bradwardine. On being asked for an explanation of this heresy, she said, Well, at any rate, Seely Stubbs got a new hat to come to church in. And though I read the Repentance and a Reconciliation chapter, which makes number twelve of Waverley, to the combatants, I was conscious that I must hasten on to scenes more exciting if I meant to retain the attention of my small but exacting audience. Furthermore, it was beginning to rain. So, hurriedly breaking off the tale, we drove back to Melrose across the green olms of St. Boswell's. It was after the hour of tea, and the crowd of visitors had ebbed away from the precincts of the abbey before the tale was resumed. A flat throwstone sustained the narrator, while the four disposed themselves on the sunny grass, and the various attitudes of severe inattention which youth assumes when listening to a story. Sweetheart poured into the depths of a buttercup. Hugh John scratched the free stone of a half-buried tomb with a nail till told to stop. Sir Toady Lion, having a pinch bug corralled in his palms, sat regarding it cautiously between his thumbs. Only Maid Margaret, her dimpled chin on her knuckles, sat looking upward in rapt attention. For her, there was no joy like that of a story. Only she was too young to mind letting the tale-teller know it. That made the difference. Above our heads the beautiful ruin mounted, now all red gold in the lights and purple in the shadows, while round and round and through and through from the highest tower to the lowest arch the swifts shrieked and swooped. Next morning, I continued, looking up for inspiration to the pinnacles of Melrose cut against the clear sky of evening as sharply as when John Morrow, Master Mason, looked upon his finished work and found it very good. Next morning, as Captain Edward Waverley was setting out for his morning walk, he found the castle of Bradwardine by no means the enchanted palace of silence he had first discovered. Milkmaids, bare-legged and wild-haired, ran about distractedly with pails and three-legged stools in their hands, crying, Lord, guide us, and, yes, sirs. 
Bailey MacWeeble, mounted on his dumpy, round-barreled pony, rode hither and thither with half the ragged rascals of the neighborhood clattering after him. The baron paced the terrace every moment, glancing angrily up at the highland hills from under his bushy gray eyebrows. From the buyer lasses and the bailey, Edward could obtain no satisfactory explanation of the disturbance. He judged it wiser not to seek it from the angry baron. Within doors, however, he found Rose, who, though troubled and anxious, replied to his questions readily enough. There has been a creech, that is, a raid of cattle stealers out from the highland hills, she told him hardly able to keep back her tears, not, she explained, because of the lost cattle, but because she feared that the anger of her father might end in the slaying of some of the Katerans, and in a blood feud which would last as long as they or any of their family lived. And all because my father is too proud to pay blackmail to Vic Ian for, she added. Is the gentleman with that curious name, said Edward, a local robber or a thief-taker? Oh, no! Rose laughed outright at his southern ignorance. He is a great highland chief and a very handsome man. Ah, if only my father would be friends with Fergus MacIver, then Tully Valen would once again be a safe and happy home. He and my father quarreled at a county meeting about who should take the first place. In his heat, he told my father that he was under his banner and paid him tribute. But it was Bailey MacWeeble who paid the money, without my father's knowledge. And since then... He and Vicky and Vor have not been friends. But what is blackmail? Edward asked in astonishment, for he thought that such things had been done away with long ago. All this was reading like an old black-letter book in his uncle's library. It is money, Rose explained, which, if you live near the highland border, you must pay to the nearest powerful chief, such as Vic and Vor. And then, if your cattle are driven away, all you have to do is just to send him word and he will have them sent back, or others is good in their places. Oh, you do not know how dreadful to be at feud with a man like Fergus MacIver. I was only a girl of ten when my father and his servants had a skirmish with a party of them near our home farm. So near, indeed, that some of the windows of the house were broken by the bullets and three of the Highland raiders were killed. I remember seeing them brought in and laid on the floor in the hall, each wrapped in his plaid. The next morning... Their wives and daughters came, clapping their hands and crying the corona and shrieking, and they carried away the dead bodies, with the pipes playing before them. Oh, I could not sleep for weeks afterwards without starting up, thinking that I heard again those terrible cries. All this seemed like a dream to Waverley, to hear this young gentle girl of seventeen talk familiarly of dark and bloody deeds such as even he, a grown man and a soldier, had only imagined, yet which she had seen with her own eyes. By dinner-time, the baron's mood had grown somewhat less stormy. He seemed for the moment to forget his wounded honor and was even offering, as soon as the quarrel was made up, to provide Edward with introductions to many powerful northern chiefs, when the door opened and a Highlander in full costume was shown in by the butler. "'Welcome, Evan du Macombich, said the baron, without rising and speaking in the manner of a prince receiving an embassy. What news from Fergus MacIver of Vor? The ambassador delivered a courteous greeting from the Highland chief. Fergus MacIver, he said, was sorry for the cloud that hung between him and his ancient friend. He hoped that the baron would be sorry too and that he should say so. More than this he did not ask. This the baron readily did, drinking to the health of the chief of the MacIvers while Evan Macombich in turn drank prosperity to the house of Bradwardine. Then, these high matters being finished, the Highlander retired with Bailey MacWeeble, doubtless to arrange with him concerning the arrears of blackmail. But of that, the Baron was supposed to know nothing. This done, the Highlander began to ask all about the party which had driven off the cattle, their appearance, whence they had come, and in what place they had last been seen. Edward was very much interested by the man's shrewd questions and the quickness with which he arrived at his conclusions, while... On his part, Evan Dew was so flattered by the evident interest of the young Englishman that he invited him to take a walk with him into the mountains in search of the cattle, promising him that if the matter turned out as he expected, he would take Edward to such a place as he had never seen before and might never have a chance of seeing again. Waverley accepted with eager joy, and though Rose Bradwardine turned pale at the idea, the baron, who loved boldness in the young, encouraged the adventure. 
He gave Edward a young gamekeeper to carry his pack and to be his attendant so that he might make the journey with fitting dignity. Through a great pass full of rugged rocks and seamed with roaring torrents indeed, the very pass of Ballybow in which the revivers had last been spied, across weary and dangerous morasses, where Edward had perforce to spring from tuft to tussock of coarse grass, Evan Dhu led our hero into the depths of the wild highland country, where no Saxon foot trod, or dared to tread, without the leave of Vic Ian Vor, as the chief's foster brother took occasion to inform Edward more than once. By this time the night was coming on, and Edward's attendant was sent off with one of Evan Dhu's men that they might find a place to sleep in, while Evan himself pushed forward to warn the supposed cattle-stealer, one Donald Bean Lean, of the party's near approach, for, as Evan Dhu said, the Cateran might very naturally be startled by the sudden appearance of Sildaroy, or a red soldier, in the very place of his most secret retreat. Edward was thus left alone with the single remaining Highlander, from whom, however, he could obtain no further information as to his journey's end, save that, as the Sassanach was somewhat tired, Donald Bean might possibly send the Curragh for him. Edward wished much to know whether the Curragh was a horse, a cart, or a chaise, but in spite of all his efforts he could get no more out of the man with the Lakbar axe than the words repeated over and over again, Ach, ay, the Curragh, ach, ay, the Curragh. However, after stumbling on a little farther, they came out on the shores of a loch, and the guide, pointing through the darkness in the direction of a little spark of light far away across the water, said, Yon's the cove. Almost at the same moment, the dash of oars was heard, and a shrill whistle came to their ears out of the darkness. This, the Highlander answered, and a boat appeared in which Edward was soon seated and on his way to the robber's cave. The light, which at first had been no bigger than a rushlight, grew rapidly larger, glowing red, as it seemed, upon the very bosom of the lake. Cliffs began to rise above their heads, hiding the moon. And, as the boat rapidly advanced, Edward could make out a great fire kindled on the shore into which the dark, mysterious figures were busy flinging pine branches. The fire had been built on a narrow ledge at the opening of a great black cavern into which an inlet of the loch seemed to advance. The men rowed straight for this black entrance, then, letting the boat run on with shipped oars, the fire was soon passed and left behind, and the cavern entered through a great rocky arch. At the foot of some natural steps, the boat stopped. The beacon brands which had served to guide them were thrown hissing into the water, and Edward found himself lifted out of the boat by brawny arms and carried almost bodily into the depths of the cavern. Presently, however, he was allowed to walk, though still guided on either side when suddenly at a turn of the rock passage the cave opened out, and Edward found the famous Cateran, Donald Bean Lean, with his whole establishment plain before his eyes. The cavern was lit with pine torches, and a charcoal fire five or six highlanders were seated about, while in the dusk behind several others slumbered wrapped in their plaids. In a large recess to one side were seen the carcasses of both sheep and cattle, hung by the heels as in a butcher's shop. Some of them, all too evidently the spoils of the Baron of Bradwardine's flocks and herds. The master of this strange dwelling came forward to welcome Edward, while Evan Dew stood by his side to make the necessary introductions. Edward had expected to meet with a huge, savage warrior in the captain of such banditti, but to his surprise he found Donald Bean Lean to be a little man, pale and insignificant in appearance, and not even highland in dress. For, at one time Donald had served in the French army. So now, instead of receiving Edward in his national costume, he had put on an old blue and red foreign uniform in which he made so strange a figure that, though it was donned in his honor, his visitor had hard work to keep from laughing. Nor was the freebooter's conversation more in accord with his surroundings. He talked much of Edward's family and connections, and especially of his uncle's Jacobite politics, on which last account he seemed inclined to welcome the young man with more cordiality than, as a soldier of King George, Edward felt to be his due. The scene which followed was, however, better fitted to the time and place. At a half-savage feast, Edward had the opportunity of tasting steaks, fresh cut from the baron's castle, broiled on the coals before his eyes and washed down with draughts of highland whiskey. Yet, in spite of the warmth of his welcome, there was something very secret and unpleasant about the shifty, cunning glance of this robber thief, 
who seemed to know so much about the royal garrisons and even about the men of Edward's own troop, whom he had brought with him from Waverley Honour. When at last they were left alone together, Evan Dew having lain down his plaid, the little captain of cattle-lifters asked Captain Waverley, in a very significant manner, if he had nothing particular to say to him. Edward, a little startled at the tone in which the question was put, answered that he had no other reason for coming to the cave but a desire to see so strange a dwelling-place. For a moment, Donald Bean Lean looked at him full in the face, as if waiting for something more, and then, with a nod full of meaning, he muttered, You might as well have confided in me. I am as worthy of trust as either the Baron of Bradwardine or Vicky and Vore, but you are equally welcome to my house. His heather bed, the flickering of the fire, the smoking torches, and the movement of the wild outlaws going and coming out of the cave soon, however, diverted Waverley's thoughts from the mysterious words of his host. His eyelids drew together, nor did he reopen them till the morning sun reflected from the lake was filling all the cave with a glimmering twilight. As soon as this part of the tale was finished, the audience showed much greater eagerness to enter immediately upon the acting of Donald Bean Lean's cattle raid and its consequences than it had previously displayed as to the doings of Edward Waverley. As Hugh John admitted, this was something like. The abbey precincts were instantly filled with the mingled sounds characteristic of all well-conducted forays, and it was well indeed that the place was wholly deserted. For the lowings of the driven cattle, the shouts of the triumphant highlanders, the deep rage of the baron stalking to and fro wrapped in his cloak on the castle terrace, might well have astonished the crowd which in these summer days comes from the four corners of the world to view fair Melrose aright. It was not till the edge had worn off of their first enthusiasm that it became possible to collect them again in order to read The Hold of a Highland Robber, which makes chapter 17th of Waverley itself. And the reading so fired the enthusiasm of Sweetheart that she asked for the book to take to bed with her. The boys were more practical, though equally enthusiastic. Wait till we get home, cried Hugh John, cracking his fingers and thumbs. I know a proper place for Donald Bean Lean's cave. And I, said Sir Tony Lyon, will light a fire by the pond and toss the embers into the water. It'll be jolly to hear him hiss, I tell you. But what, asked Maid Margaret, shall we do for the cattle and sheep that were hanging by the heels when Edward went into Donald Bean Lean's cave? Why, we will hang you up by the heels and cut slices off you, said Sir Toady with frowning truculence. Whereat the little girl, a little solemnized, began to edge away from the dangerous neighborhood of such a pair of young cannibals. Sweetheart reproached her brothers for inventing calamities against their countrymen. Even the Highlanders were never so wicked, she objected. They did not eat one another. Well, anyway, retorted Sir Toady Lyon, unabashed. Sonny Bean did. Perhaps he is a cousin of Donald's, though in the history it says he came from East Lothian. Yes, cried Hugh John. And in an old book written in Latin it says, Father read it to us, that one of his little girls was too young to be executed with the rest of the Sands of Leith. So the king sent her to be brought up by kind people, where she was brought up without knowing anything of her father, the cannibal, and her mother, the cannibalist. Oh, cried Sweetheart, who knew it was coming, putting up her hands over her ears. Please don't tell that dreadful story all over again. Father read it out of a book, so there, cried Sir Toady implacably. Go on, Hugh John. And so when this girl was about as big as Sweetheart, and of course could not remember her grandfather's nice cave or the larder where the arms and legs were hung up and smoked to dry. Oh, you horrid boy, cried Sweetheart, not, however, removing herself out of earshot, because, after all, it was nice to shiver just a little. Oh, yes, and I've seen the cave, cried Sir Toady. It's on the shore near Ballantrae. Horrid place. Go on, Hugh John. Tell about Sonny Bean's grandchild. Well, she grew up and up, playing with dolls just like other little girls, till she was old enough to be sent out to service. And after she had been a while about the house to which she went, it was noticed that some of the babies in the neighborhood began to go missing, and they found... I think she was a nursemaid, interrupted Sir Toady dispassionately. That must have been it. The little wretches cried, so she ate them. Oh, cried Sweetheart, stopping her ears with her fingers. Don't tell us what they found. I believe you made it all up anyway. No, I didn't, 
cried Hugh John, shouting in her ear as if to a very deaf person. It was father who read it to us out of a big book with fat black letters, so it must be true. Sir Toady was trying to drag away his sister's arms that she might have the benefit of details when I appeared in the distance. Whereupon Hugh John, who felt his time growing limited, concluded thus. And when they were taking the girl away to hang her, the minister asked her why she had killed the babies, and she answered him, If only people knew how good babies were, especially little girls, there would be no one left between Forth and Solway. Then, quite unexpectedly, Maid Margaret began to sob bitterly. They shan't hang me up and eat me, she cried, running as hard as she could and flinging herself into my arms. Hugh John and Sir Toady say they will, as soon as we get home. Happily, I had a light cane of a good vintage in my hand, and it did not take long to convince the pair of young scamps of the inconvenience of frightening their little sister. Sweetheart looked on approvingly as two forlorn young men were walked off to a supper, healthfully composed of plain bread and butter, and washed down by a nice cool water from the pump. I told you, she said, you wouldn't believe me. All the same, she was tender-hearted enough to convey a platter of broken meats secretly up to their condemned cell, as I knew from finding the empty plate under their washstand in the morning. And as Maid Margaret was being carried off to be bathed and comforted, a voice, passing their door, threatened additional pains and penalties to little boys who frightened their sisters. It was all in a book, said Hugh John, defending himself from under the bedclothes. Father read it to us. We did it for her good, suggested Sir Toady. If I hear another word out of you, broke in the voice, and then added, Go to sleep this instant. The incident of the cave had long been forgotten and forgiven before I could continue the story of Waverley in the cave of Donald Bean Lean. We sat once more in an orane house at Hame, or rather outside it, near a pleasant chalet in a wood, from which place you can see a brown and turbulent river running downward to the sea. When Edward awoke next morning, he could not for a moment remember where he was. The cave was deserted. Only the gray ashes of the fire, a few gnawed bones, and an empty keg remained to prove that he was still on the scene of last night's feast. He went out into the sunlight. In a little natural harbor, the boat was lying snugly moored. Farther out on a rocky spit was the mark of last night's beacon fire. Here Waverley had to turn back. Cliffs shut him in on every side, and Edward was at a loss of what to do, till he discovered, climbing perilously out in the rock above the cave mouth, some slight steps or ledges. These he mounted with difficulty, and, passing over the shoulder of the cliff, found himself presently on the shores of a loch, about four miles long, surrounded on every side by wild, heathery mountains. In the distance he could see a man fishing and a companion watching him. By the Lockhaber axe which the latter carried, Edward recognized the fisher as Evan Dew. On a stretch of sand beneath a birch tree, a girl was laying out a breakfast of milk, eggs, barley bread, fresh butter, and honeycomb. She was singing blithely, yet she must have had to travel far that morning to collect such dainties in so desolate a region. This proved to be Alice, the daughter of Donald Bean Lean, and it is nothing to discredit that she had made herself as pretty as she could that she might attend upon the handsome young Englishman. All communication, however, had to be by smiles and signs, for Alice spoke no English. Nevertheless, she set out her dainties with right good will, and then seated herself on a stone a little distance away to watch for an opportunity of serving the young soldier. Presently, Evan Dew came up with his catch of fine salmon trout, and soon slices of the fish were broiling on the wood embers. After breakfast, Alice gathered up what was left into a wicker basket, and, flinging her plaid about her, presented her cheek to Edward for the stranger's kiss. Evan Dew made haste to secure a similar privilege, but Alice sprang lightly up the bank out of his reach, and with an arch wave of her hand to Edward, she disappeared. Then Evan Dew led Edward back to the boat. The three men embarked, and after emerging from the mouth of the cavern, a clumsy sail was hoisted, and they bore away up the lake. 
Evan Dew all the time loud in the praises of Alice Bean Lean. Edward said that it was a pity that such a maiden should be the daughter of a common thief, but this Evan hotly denied. According to Evan, Donald Bean Lean, though indeed no reputable character, was far from being a thief. A thief was one who stole a cow from a poor cotter, but he who lifted a drove from a Sackanac lard was a gentleman drover. But he would be hanged all the same if he was caught, objected Edward. I do not see the difference. To be sure, he would die for the law, as many a pretty man has done before him, cried Evan. And a better death than to die lying on damp straw in yonder cave like a mangy tyke. And what? Edward suggested, would become a pretty Alice then. Alice is both canny and fendy, said the bold Evan Dew with a cock of his bonnet, and I can knock to hinder me to marry her myself. Edward laughed and applauded the Highlander's spirit, but also asked as to the fate of the Baron of Bradwardine's cattle. By this time, said Evan, I warrant they are safe in the pass of Ballybro and on their road back to Tully Valen and that is more than a regiment of King George's Red Soldiers could have brought about. Evan Dew had indeed some reason to be proud. Reassured as to this, Edward accompanied his guide with more confidence toward the castle of Vicky and Vore. The five miles Scots seemed to stretch themselves out indefinitely, but at last the figure of a hunter, equipped with gun, dogs, and a single attendant, was seen across the heath. Sure said the man with the lockhaver axe. That's the chief. Evan Dew, who had boasted of his master's great retinue, denied it fiercely. The chief, he said, would not come out with never a soul with him but Callum Beg to meet with an English gentleman. But in spite of this prophecy, the chief of Clan Ivor it was. Fergus MacIver, whom his people called Vicky and Vor, was a young man of much grace and dignity, educated in France, and of a strong, secret, and turbulent character, which by policy he hid for the most part under an appearance of courtesy and kindness. He had long been mustering his clan in secret in order once more to take a leading part in another attempt to dethrone King George, and to set on the throne of Britain either the Chevalier St. George or his son, Prince Charles. When Waverley and the chief approached the castle, a stern and rugged pile surrounded by walls, they found a large body of armed Highlanders drawn up before the gate. These, said Vicky and Vore carelessly, are a part of the clan whom I ordered out to see that they were in a fit state to defend the country in such troublous times. Would Captain Waverley care to see them go through part of their exercise? Thereupon, the men, after showing their dexterity at drill and their fine target shooting, divided into two parties and went through the incidents of a battle, the charge, the combat, the flight, and the headlong pursuit, all to the sound of the great war pipes. Edward asked why, with so large a force, the chief did not at once put down such rubber bands as that of Donald Bean Lean. Because, said the chief bitterly, if I did, I should at once be summoned to Stirling Castle to deliver up the few broadswords the government has left us. I should gain little by that, but there's dinner, he added, as if anxious to change the subject. Let me show you the inside of my rude mansion. The long and crowded dinner table to which Edward sat down told of the chief's immense hospitality. After the meal, healths were drunk and the bard of the clan recited a wild and thrilling poem in Gaelic, which of course, Edward could not understand so much as one word, though it excited the clansmen so that they sprang up in ecstasy, many of them waving their arms about in sympathy with the warlike verses. The chief, exactly in the ancient manner, presented a silver cup full of wine to the minstrel. He was to drink the one and keep the other for himself. After a few more toasts, Vicky and Vor offered to take Waverley up to be presented to his sister. They found Flora MacIver in her parlour, a plain and bare chamber with a wide prospect from the windows. She had her brother's dark curling hair, dark eyes, and lofty expression, but her expression seemed sweeter, though not perhaps softer. She was, however, even more fiercely Jacobite than her brother, and her devotion to the king over the water, as they called King James, was far more unselfish than that of Vicky and Vore. 
Flora MacIver had been educated in a French convent, yet now she gave herself heart and soul to the good of her wild highland clan and to the service of him whom she looked on as the true king. She was gracious to Edward, and at the request of Fergus, told him the meaning of the war song he had been listening to in the hall. She was, her brother said, famed for her translations from Gaelic into English, but for the present she could not be persuaded to recite any of these to Edward. He had better fortune, however, when finding Flora MacIver in a wild spot by a waterfall, she sang to him, to the accompaniment of a harp, a song of great chiefs and their deeds which fired the soul of the young man. He could not help admiring, and he almost began to love her from that moment. After this reception, Edward continued very willingly at Glenacriach, both because of his growing admiration for Flora and because his curiosity increased every day as to this wild race and the life so different from all that he had hitherto known. Nothing occurred for three weeks to disturb his pleasant dreams, save the chance discovery made when he was writing a letter to the Baron that he had somehow lost his seal with the arms of Waverley which he wore attached to his watch. Flora was inclined to blame Donald Bean Lean for the theft, but the chief scouted the idea. It was impossible, he said, when Edward was his guest, and besides, he added slyly, Donald would never have taken the seal and left the watch. Whereupon Edward borrowed Vicky and Vore's seal, and having dispatched his letter, thought no more of the matter. Soon afterwards, whilst Waverley still remained at Glenachia, there was a great hunting of the stag, to which Fergus went with three hundred of his clan to meet some of the greatest Highland chiefs, his neighbors. He took Edward with him, and the numbers present amounted almost to those of a formidable army. While the clansmen drove in the deer, the chiefs sat on the heather in little groups and talked in low tones. During the drive, the main body of the deer, in their desperation, charged right upon the place where the chief sportsmen were sitting in ambush. The word was given for everyone to fling himself down on his face. Edward, not understanding the language, remained erect, and his life was saved only by the quickness of Vicky and Vore, who seized him and flung him down, holding him there by main force, till the whole herd had rushed over them. When Edward tried to rise, he found that he had severely sprained his ankle. However, among those present at the drive, there was found an old man, half surgeon, half conjurer, who applied hot fomentations, muttering all the time of the operation such gibberish as Gaspar, Melchior, Balthazar, Max Praxfax. Thus it happened that, to his great disappointment, Edward was unable to accompany the clansmen and their chiefs any farther. So Vicky and Vor had Edward placed in a litter, woven of birch and hazel, and walked beside this rude coach to the house of an old man, a smaller chieftain who, with only a few old vassals, lived a retired life at a place called Tomrite. Here he left Edward to recruit, promising to come back in a few days in the hope that by that time Edward would be able to ride a highland pony in order to return to Glenacreach. On the sixth morning Fergus returned, and Edward gladly mounted to accompany him. As they approached the castle, he saw with pleasure Flora coming to meet them. The chief's beautiful sister appeared very glad to see Edward, and as her brother spoke a few hasty words to her in Gaelic, she suddenly clasped her hands, and looking up to heaven appeared to ask a blessing upon some enterprise. She then gave Edward some letters that had arrived for him during his absence. It was perhaps as well that Edward took these to his room to open, considering the amount of varied ill news that he found in them. The first was from his father, who had just been dismissed from his position as king's minister, owing, as he put it, to the ingratitude of the great, but really, as was proved afterwards, on account of some political plots which he had formed against his chief, the prime minister of the day. Then, his generous uncle, Sir Everard, wrote that all differences were over between his brother and himself. He had espoused his quarrel, and he directed Edward at once to send in the resignation of his commission to the war office without any preliminaries, forbidding him longer from serving a government which had treated his father so badly. But the letter which touched Edward most deeply was one from his commanding officer at Dundee, 
which declared curtly that if he did not report himself at the headquarters of the regiment within three days after the date of writing, he would be obliged to take steps in the matter which would be exceedingly disagreeable to Captain Waverley. Edward at once sat down and wrote to Colonel Gardiner that, as he had thus chosen to efface the remembrance of past civilities, there was nothing left to him but to resign his commission, which he did formally, and ended his letter by requesting his commanding officer to forward this resignation to the proper quarter. No little perplexed as to the meaning of all this, Edward was on his way to consult Fergus MacIver on the subject when the latter advanced with an open newspaper in his hand. Your letters, he asked, confirm this unpleasant news? and he held out the Caledonian Mercury, in which not only did he find his father's disgrace chronicled, but on turning to the Gazette he found the words, Edward Waverley, captain in the regiment of dragoons, superseded for absence without leave. The name of his successor, one Captain Butler, followed immediately. On looking at the date of Colonel Gardiner's missive as compared with that of the Gazette, it was evident that his commanding officer had carried out his threat to the letter. Yet it was not at all like him to have done so. It was still more out of keeping with the constant kindness that he had shown to Edward. It was the young man's first idea, in accordance with the customs of the time, to send Colonel Gardiner a challenge. But upon Fergus MacIver's advice, Edward ultimately contented himself with adding a postscript to his first letter, marking the time at which he had received the first summons and regretting the hastiness of his commander's action had prevented his anticipating it by sending in his resignation. That, if anything, said Fergus, will make this Calvinistic colonel blush for his injustice. But it was not long before some part at least of the mystery was made plain. Fergus took advantage of Edward's natural anger at his unworthy treatment to reveal to him that a great rising was about to take place in the Highlands in favor of King James and to urge him to cast his lot in with the clans. Flora, on the contrary, urged him to be careful and cautious, lest he should involve others to whom he owed everything in a common danger with himself. Edward, whose fancy, if not whose heart, had gradually been turning more and more toward the beautiful and patriotic Flora, appeared less interested in rebellion than in obtaining her brother's good will and bespeaking his influence with his sister. Out upon you, cried Fergus, with pretended ill humor. Can you think of nothing but ladies at such a time? Besides, why come to me in such a manner? Flora is up the glen. Go and ask herself. And Cupid go with you. But do not forget that my lovely sister, like her loving brother, is apt to have a pretty strong will of her own. Edward's heart beat as he went up the rocky hillside to find Flora. She received and listened to him with kindness, but steadily refused to grant him the least encouragement. All her thoughts, her hopes, her life itself, were set on the success of this one bold stroke for a crown. Till the rightful king was on his throne, she could not think of anything else. Love and marriage were not for such as Flora MacIver. Edward, in spite of the manifest goodwill of the chief, had to be content with such cold comfort as he could extract from Flora's promise that she would remember him in her prayers. Next morning, Edward was awakened to the familiar sound of daft Davy Gelatley's voice singing below his window. For a moment he thought himself back at Tully Valen. Davy was declaring loudly that, My heart's in the highland, my heart is not here. Then, immediately changing to a less sentimental strain, he added with a contemptuous accent, There's nacht in the highlands but sobies and leeks and langlegget callants gone wanting the breeks, wanting the breeks without hows or shoon, but we'll all win the breeks when King Jamie comes home. Edward, eager to know what had brought the Bradwardine innocent so far from home, dressed hastily and went down. Davy, without stopping his dancing for a moment, came whirling past and, as he went, thrust a letter into Waverley's hand. It proved to be from Rose Bradwardine, and, among other things, it contained the news that the Baron had gone away to the north with a body of horsemen, while the Red Soldiers had been at Tully Valen, searching for her father and also asking after Edward himself. Indeed, they had carried off his servant prisoner, together with everything he had left at Tully Valen. Rose also warned him against the danger of returning thither, and at the same time sent her compliments to Fergus and Flora. The last words of the letter were, 
Is she not as handsome and accomplished as I described her to be? Edward was exceedingly perplexed. Knowing his innocence of all treason, he could not imagine why he should be accused of it. He consulted Fergus, who told him to a certainty he would be hanged or imprisoned if he went south. Nevertheless, Edward persisted in running his hazard. The chief, though wishful to keep him, did not absolutely say him nay. Flora, instead of coming down to bid him good-bye, sent only excuses. So together it was in no happy frame of mind that Edward rode away to the south upon the chief's horse, Brown Dermid, and with Callum Begg for an attendant in the guise of a lowland groom. Callum warned his master against saying anything when they got to the first little lowland town, either on the subject of the Highlands or about his master, Vicky and Vore. The people there be bitter wigs till burst them, he said fiercely. As they rode on, they saw many people about the street, chiefly old women in tartan hoods and red cloaks, who seemed to cast up their hands in horror at the sight of Waverley's horse. Edward asked the reason. Oh, said Callum Begg, it's either the Muckle Sunday herself or little government Sunday that they carry the fast. It proved to be the latter, and the innkeeper, a severe, sly-looking man, received them with scanty welcome. Indeed, he only admitted them because he remembered that it was in his power to fine them for the crime of travelling on a fast day by an addition to the length of his reckoning next morning. But as soon as Edward announced his wish for a horse and guide to Perth, the hypocritical landlord made ready to go with him in person. Callum Begg, excited by the golden guinea which Waverley gave him, offered to show his gratitude by waiting a little distance along the road and kittling the landlord's quarters with Shilako or, in other words, setting a dagger in his back. Apparently, Vic Ian Vore's page thought no more of such a deed than an ordinary English boy would have thought of stealing an apple out of an orchard. Among the listeners, there was somewhat less inclination than before to act this part of the story. For one thing, the boys were righteously indignant that the idea of any true hero being in love, unless, indeed, he could carry off his bride from the deck of a pirate vessel, cutlass in hand and noble words of daring on his lips. As for the girls, well, they knew that the bushes were dripping wet, and if they set their feet upon their native heath, they would certainly be made to change their stockings as soon as they went home. This was a severe discourager of romance. There was nothing to prevent any one of them from asking questions, however, that was the business in which they excelled. But why did the Highland people want to rebel anyway? demanded Hugh John. If I could have hunted like that and raided and carried off cattle and had a castle with pipes playing and hundreds of clansmen to drill, I shouldn't have been such a soft as to rebel and get it all taken away from me. It was because they were loyal to their rightful king, said Sweetheart, who was a cavalier and a Jacobite, in the intervals of admiring Cromwell and crying because they shot down the poor Covenanters. I think said Sir Toady, who had been sitting very thoughtful, that they just liked to fight, and King George would not let them. So they wanted a king who would not mind. Same as us, you know. If we are caught fighting in school, we get whipped. But Father lets us fight outside as much as we want to. Besides, what did old Vicky and Vore want with all these silly Highlanders eating up everything in his castle if there were never any battles that they could fight for him? This was certainly a very strong and practical view, and so much impressed the others that they sat a long while quiet, turning it over in their minds. Well, at any rate, said Sweetheart, dropping her head with a sigh to go on with her seam, I know that Flora MacIver was truly patriotic. See how she refused to listen to Waverley all because she wanted to give her life for the cause. Hm, said Hugh John, disrespectfully turning up his nose. That's all girls think about love and marrying and playing on harps. I don't play on harps, sighed Sweetheart. But I do wish I had a banjo. I wish I had a targe and a broadsword and the chief's horse, Brown Dermot, to ride on, said Hugh John, putting on his biggity look. And a nice figure you would cut, sneered Sir Toady Lion provokingly. Highlanders don't fight on horseback, you ought to know that. Whereupon the first engagement of the campaign was immediately fought out on the carpet, and it was not till after the intervention of the superior power had restored quiet that the next tale from Waverley could be proceeded with.
Not long after Callum Begg had been left behind, and indeed almost as soon as the innkeeper and Edward were fairly on their way, the former suddenly announced that his horse had fallen lame, and that they must turn aside to a neighboring smithy to have the matter attended to. And, as it is the fast day, and the smith is a religious man, it may cost your honor as muckle as a sixpence a shoe, suggested the wily innkeeper, watching Edward's face as he spoke. For this announcement Edward cared nothing. He would gladly have paid a shilling a nail to be allowed to push forward on his journey with all speed. Accordingly, to the smithy of Cairnvreckian they went. The village was in an uproar. The smith, a fierce-looking man, was busy hammering dogs' heads for musket locks, while among the surrounding crowd the names of great highland chiefs, Clanronald, Glengarry, Lochiel, and that of Vickianvor himself, were being bandied from mouth to mouth. Edward soon found himself surrounded by an excited mob in the midst of which the smith's wife, a wild witch-like woman, was dancing every now and then casting her child up in the air as high as her arms would reach, singing all the while and trying to anger the crowd, and especially to infuriate her husband by the Jacobite songs which she chanted. At last the smith could stand this provocation no longer. He snatched a red-hot bar of iron from the forge and rushed at his wife, crying out loud that he would thrust it down her throat. Then, finding himself held back by the crowd from executing vengeance on the woman, all his anger turned upon Edward, whom he took to be a Jacobite emissary. For the news which had caused all this stir was that Prince Charles had landed and that the whole Highlands was rallying to his banner. So fierce and determined was the attack which the angry smith of Cairnvecchian made on Edward that the young man was compelled to draw his pistol in self-defense. And, as the crowd threatened him and the smith continued furiously to attack with the red-hot iron, almost unconsciously his finger pressed the trigger. The shot went off, and immediately the smith fell to the ground. Then Edward, borne down by the mob, was for some time in great danger of his life. He was saved at last by the interference of the minister of the parish, a kind and gentle old man who caused Edward's captors to treat him more tenderly, so that instead of executing vengeance upon the spot, as they had proposed, they brought him before the nearest magistrate, who was indeed an old military officer, and, in addition, the laird of the village of Cairnvecchian, one Major Melville by name. The latter proved to be a stern soldier, so severe in manner that he often became unintentionally unjust. Major Melville found that, though the blacksmith's wound proved to be a mere scratch, and though he had to own that the provocation given was a sufficient cause for Edward's hasty action, yet he must detain the young man prisoner upon the warrant issued against Edward Waverley, which had been sent out by the Supreme Court of Scotland. Edward, who at once owned to his name, was astonished beyond words to find that not only was he charged with being in the company of actual rebels, such as the Baron of Bradwardine and Vic Ian Vore, but also with trying to induce his troop of horse to revolt by means of private letters addressed to one of them, Sergeant Houghton, in their barracks at Dundee. Captain Waverley was asserted to have effected this through the medium of a peddler named Will Ruthian, or Wiley Will whose very name Edward had never heard up to that moment. As the magistrate's examination proceeded, Waverley was astonished to find that instead of clearing himself, everything he said, every article he carried about his person, was set down by Major Melville as additional proof of his complicity with the treason. Among these figured Flora's verses, his own presence at the great hunting match among the mountains, his father's and Sir Everard's letters, even the huge manuscripts written by his tutor, of which he had never read six pages, were all brought forward as to so many evidences of his guilt. Finally, the magistrate informed Edward that he would be compelled to detain him a prisoner in his house of Cairnvreckian, but that if he would furnish such information as it was doubtless in his power to give concerning the forces and plans of Vickian Boar and the other Highland chiefs, he might, after a brief detention, be allowed to go free. Edward fiercely exclaimed that he would die rather than turn informer against those who had been his friends and hosts, whereupon, having refused all hospitality, he was conducted to a small room, there to be guarded till there was a chance of sending him under escort to the castle of Stirling. Here he was visited by Mr. Morton, 
The minister who had saved him from the clutches of the mob, and so sympathetically and kindly did he speak, that Edward told him his whole story from the moment when he had first left Waverley Honour. And, though the minister's favourable report did not alter the opinion Major Melville had formed of Edward's treason, it softened his feelings toward the young man so much that he invited him to dinner, and afterwards did his best to procure him favourable treatment from the Westland Whig captain, Mr. Gifted Gilfillian, who commanded the party which was to convey him to Stirling Castle. The escort which was to take Edward southward was not so strong as it might have been. Part of Captain Gifted Gifillin's command had stayed behind to hear a favorite preacher upon the occasion of the afternoon feast day service at Cairnvreckian. Others straggled for purposes of their own, while, as they went along, their leader lectured Edward upon the fewness of those that should be saved. Heaven, he informed Edward, would be peopled exclusively by the members of his own denomination. Captain Gifted was still engaged in condemning all and sundry belonging to the churches of England and Scotland when a stray peddler joined his party and asked of his honor the favor of his protection as far as Stirling, urging as a reason the uncertainty of the times and the value of the property he carried in his pack. The peddler, by agreeing with all that was said and desiring further information upon spiritual matters, soon took the attention of Captain Gifted Gilfillan from his prisoner. He declared that he had even visited near Mauchline the very farm of the Whig leader. He congratulated him upon the fine breed of cattle he possessed. Then he went on to speak of the many evil, popish, and unchristian things he had seen in his travellers as a peddler over the benighted countries of Europe, whereupon gifted Gilfillan became so pleased with his companion and so enraptured with his subject that he allowed his party to string itself out along the route without an attempt at discipline or even the power of supporting each other in case of attack. The leaders were ascending a little hill covered with wind bushes and crowned with low brushwood when, after looking about him quickly to note some landmarks, the peddler put his fingers to his mouth and whistled. He explained that he was whistling on a favorite dog named Body, which he had lost. The Covenanter reproved him severely for thinking of a useless dog in the midst of such precious and improving conversation as they were holding together. But in spite of his protests, the peddler persisted in his whistling, and presently, out of a copse close to the path, six or eight stout highlanders sprang upon them, brandishing their claymores. "'The sword of the Lord and of Gideon!' shouted gifted Gilfillan, nothing daunted. And he was proceeding to lay about him stoutly when the peddler, snatching a musket, felled him to the ground with the butt. The scattered Whig party hurried up to support their leader. In the scuffle, Edward's horse was shot and he himself somewhat bruised in falling. Whereupon, some of the Highlanders took him by the arms and half supported, half carried him away from the high road, leaving the unconscious gifted still stretched on the ground. The Westlanders, thus deprived of a leader, did not even attempt a pursuit, but contented themselves with sending a few dropping shots after the Highlanders, which, of course, did nobody any harm. They carried Edward fully two miles, and it was not until they reached the deep covet of a distant glen that they stopped with their burden. Edward spoke to them repeatedly, but the only answer he got was that they had no English. Even the mention of the name of Vicky and Vore, which had hitherto regarded as a talisman, produced no response. Moreover, Edward could see from the tartans of his captors that they were not of the clan either. Nor did the hut into which they presently conveyed our hero reveal any more. Edward was placed in a large bed, planked all round, and after his bruises were attended to by an old woman, the sliding panel was shut upon him. A kind of fever set his ideas wandering, and sometimes he fancied that he heard the voice of Flora MacIver speaking in the hut without. He tried to push back the panel, but the inmates had secured it on the outside with a large nail. Waverley remained some time in these narrow quarters, ministered to by the old woman, and at intervals hearing the same gentle girlish voice speaking outside, without, however, being able to see its owner. At last, after several days, two of the Highlanders who had first captured him returned, and by signs informed him that he must get ready to follow them immediately. At this news, Edward, thoroughly tired of his confinement, rejoiced, and upon rising found himself sufficiently well to travel. He was seated in the smoky cottage quietly waiting for the signal of departure when he felt a touch on his arm, and turning, he found himself face to face with Alice, the daughter of Donald Bean Lean. 
With a quick movement, she showed him the edges of a bundle of papers, which she as swiftly concealed. She then laid her fingers on her lips and glided away to assist old Janet, his nurse, in packing his saddlebags. With the tail of his eye, however, Edward saw the girl fold the papers among his linen without being observed by the others. This being done, she took no further notice of him whatever, except that just at the last, as she was leaving the cottage, she turned round and gave him a smile and a nod of farewell. The tall Highlander, who was to lead the party, now made Edward understand that there was considerable danger on the way. He must follow without noise, and do so exactly as he was bidden. A steel pistol and a broadsword were given to him for use in case of attack. The party had not been long upon its night journeying, moving silently through the woods and copses in Indian file, before Edward found that there was good reason for this precaution. At no great distance he heard the cry of an English sentinel. All's well! Again and again the cry was taken up by other sentries till the sound was lost in the distance. The enemy was very near, but the trained senses of the Highlanders in their own rugged country were more than a match for the discipline of the regulars. A little farther on they passed a large building with lights still twinkling in the windows. Presently the Highlanders stood up and sniffed. Then, motioning Waverley to do as he did, he began to crawl on all fours toward a low and ruinous sheepfold. With some difficulty Edward obeyed, and with so much care that the stock conducted that presently, looking over a stone wall, he could see an outpost of four or six soldiers lying round their campfire while in front a sentinel paced backward and forward regarding the heavens and whistling Nancy Dawson as placidly as if he were a hundred miles from any wild rebel highlandman. At that moment, the moon, which up to this time had been hidden behind clouds, shone out clear and bright. So Edward and his highland guide had perforce to remain where they were, stuck up against the dyke, not daring to continue their journey in the full glare of light while the highlander muttered curses on Macfarlane's lanthorn, as he called the moon. At last, the highlander, motioning Edward to stay where he was, began with infinite pains to worm his way backward on all fours, taking advantage of every bit of cover, lying stock still behind a boulder while the sentry was looking in his direction and again crawling swiftly to a more distant bush as often as he turned his back or marched the other way. Presently, Edward lost sight of the Highlander. But before long he came out again in an altogether different part of the thicket, in full view of the sentinel at whom he immediately fired a shot, the bullet wounding the soldier on the arm, stopping once and for all the whistling of Nancy Dawson. Then, all the soldiers, awakened by the shot and their comrade's cry, advanced alertly toward the spot where the tall man had been seen. He had, however, retired, but continued to give them occasionally such a view of his figure in the open moonlight as to lead them yet farther from the path. Meanwhile, taking advantage of their leader's ruse, Waverley and his attendants made good speed over the heather till they got behind a rising ground from which, however, they could still hear the shouts of the pursuers and the more distant roll of the royal drums beating to arms. They had not gone far before they came upon an encampment in a hollow. Here several highlanders with a horse or two lay concealed. They had not arrived very long before the tall highlander, who had led the soldiers such a dance, made his appearance quite out of breath, but laughing gaily at the ease with which he had tricked his pursuers. Edward was now mounted on a stout pony and the whole party set forward at a good round pace, accompanied by the Highlanders as an escort. They continued without molestation all the night, till in the morning light they saw a tall old castle on the opposite bank of the river, upon the battlements of which they could see the plaid and targe of a Highland sentry, and over which floated the white banner of the exiled Stuarts. They passed through a small town, and presently were admitted into the courtyard of the ancient fortress, where Edward was courteously received by a cheap in full dress and wearing a white cockade. He showed Waverley directly to a half-ruinous apartment where, however, there was a small camp bed. Here he was about to leave him, after asking what refreshment he would take, when Edward, who had had enough of the mysteries, requested that he might be told where he was. You're in the castle of Doon, in the district of Mentheth said the governor of the castle, and you are in no danger whatever. I command here for his royal highness, Prince Charles. At last it seemed to Waverley as if he had reached a place of rest and safety. But it was not to be. 
On the very next day, he was put in charge of a detachment of irregular horsemen who were making their way eastward to join the forces of the prince. The leader of this band was no other than the laird of Bamawapple, who, backing words by deeds, had mustered his grooms and huntsmen in the cause of the Stuarts. Edward attempted to speak civilly to him, but found himself brutally repulsed. Captain Falconer of Bamoapple had no ways forgotten the shrewd pinch in the sword arm which he had received from the Baron of Bradwardine in Waverley's quarrel. At first, Edward had better luck with his lieutenant, a certain horse copper or dealer. This man had sold Bamoapple the charges upon which to mount his motley array, and, seeing no chance of getting his money except by going out himself, he had accepted the post of lieutenant in the Chevalier's army. So far, good. But just at the moment when it seemed that our hero was about to get some information of a useful sort, Bamoapple rode up and demanded of his lieutenant if he had not heard his orders that no one should speak to the prisoner. After that, they marched in silence, till, as the little company of adventurers was passing Stirling Castle, Bamoapple must needs sound his trumpet and display his white banner. This bravado, considerably to that gentleman's discomfiture, was answered at once by a burst of smoke from the castle, and the next moment a cannonball knocked up the earth a few feet from the captain's charger and covered Bamoapple himself with dirt and stones. An immediate retreat of the command took place without having been specially ordered. As they approached Edinburgh, they could see that white wreaths of smoke encircled the castle. The cannonade rolled continuously. Bamoapple, however, warned by what had happened at Stirling, gave the castle a wide berth, and finally, without having entered the city, he delivered up his prisoner at the door of the ancient palace of Holyrood. And so, for the time being, Edward's adventures in the wild highlands were ended. This time, the children were frankly delighted. It's just like kidnapped, father, cried Hugh John, more truly than he dreamed of. There's the flight through the heather, you remember, and the tall man is Alan Breck, heading off soldiers after the red fox was shot. There was that sentinel that whistled, too. Alan heard him while he was fishing and learned the tune. Oh, and a lot of things the same. I like the part best where Alice Bean gives him the papers, said Sweetheart. Perhaps she was in love with him, too. Pshaw, cried Toady Lion. Much good that did him. He never even got them looked at, but it was a pity that he not got a chance at a King George soldier with that lovely sword and steel pistol. The Highlanders had all the luck. I would have banged it off anyway, declared Hugh John. Fancy carrying a pistol like that all the way, scouting and going Indian file and never getting a shot at anybody? What I want to know, said Sweetheart dreamily, is why they all thought Edward a traitor. I believe the papers that Alice Bean Lean put in his bag would reveal the secret if Waverley only had time to read them. Him, said Sir Toady, naturally suspicious of all girls' heroes. Why, he's always falling down and getting put to bed. Then somebody has to nurse him. Why doesn't he go out and fight like Fergus MacIver? Then perhaps Flora would have him, though what he wanted her for, a girl, I don't know. She could play harps and make poetry. So with this bitter scorn for the liberal arts, they all rushed off to enact the whole story, the tale-teller consenting as occasion required to take the parts of the wounded smith, the stern judge, or the Cameronian captain. Hugh John hectored insufferably as Waverley. Sir Toady scouted and stalked as the tall Highlander, whom he refused to regard as anybody but Alan Breck. Sweetheart moved gently about as Alice Bean, preparing breakfast was quite in her line, while Maid Margaret, wildly excited, ran hither and thither as a sort of impartial chorus, warning all and sundry of the movements of the enemy. I saw her last, seated on a knoll and calling out, BANG! at the pitch of her voice. She was, she explained, nothing less imposing than the castle of Edinburgh itself, cannonading the ranks of the pretender, while far away upon wooden chargers Bamoapple's cavalry curvetted on the slopes of Arthur's seat and cracked vain pistols at the frowning fortress. There was, in fact, all through the afternoon a great deal of imagination loose in our neighborhood and even far into the gloaming sounds of battle, boastful recriminations, the clash of swords, the trample and rally of the heavy charge, and even the cries of the genuinely wounded, came fitfully from this corner and that of the wide shrubberies. And when all was over, as they sat reunited, black Hanoverian and white cockade, victor and vanquished in the kindly truce of the supper-table, Hugh John delivered his verdict. 
That's the best tale you've told us yet. Every man of us needed to have sticking plaster put on when we came in, even sweetheart. Then which, of course, nothing could have been more satisfactory. It was Fergus MacIver himself who welcomed Edward within the palace of Holyrood, where the adventurous prince now kept his court. Hardly would he allow Edward even to ask news of Flora before carrying him off into the presence chamber to be presented. Edward was deeply moved by the chevalier's grace and dignity, as well as moved by the reception he received. The prince praised the deeds of his ancestors and called upon him to emulate them. He also showed him a proclamation in which his name was mentioned along with those of the other rebels as guilty of high treason. Edward's heart was melted. This princely kindness, so different from the treatment which he had received at the hands of the English government, the direct appeal of the handsome and gallant young chevalier, perhaps also the thought of pleasing Flora in the only way open to him, all overwhelmed the young man, so that, with a sudden burst of resolve, he knelt down and devoted his life and his sword to the cause of King James. The prince raised and embraced Waverley, and in a few words confided to him that the English general, having declined battle and gone north to Aberdeen, had brought his forces back to Dunbar by sea. Here it was, the prince's instant intention to attack him. Before taking leave, he presented Edward with the splendid silver-hilted sword which he wore, itself an heirloom of the Stuarts. Then he gave him over into the hands of Fergus MacIver, for who with proceeded to make Waverley into a true son of Ivor by arraying him in the tartan of the clan, with plaid flowing over his shoulder and buckler glancing upon his arm. Soon after came the Baron of Bradwardine, anxious about the honor of his young friend Edward. He said that he desired to know the truth as to the manner in which Captain Waverley had lost his commission in Colonel Gardiner's dragoons, so that, if he should hear his honor called in question, he might be able to defend it, which no doubt he would have performed as stoutly and loyally as he had previously done upon the sulky person of the Laird of Bamawapple. The morrow was to be a day of battle, but it was quite in keeping with the gay character of the adventurer prince that the evening should be spent in a hall in the ancient palace of Holyrood. Here, Edward, in his new full dress as a Highlander and a son of Ivor, shone as the handsomest and the boldest of all, and this too, in spite of the marked coldness with which Flora treated him. But to make amends, Rose Bradwardine, close by her friend's side, watched him with a sigh on her lip and colour on her cheek, yet with a sort of pride, too, that she should have been the first to discover what a gallant and soldierly youth he was. Jacobite or Hanoverian she cared not. At Tully Valen or at a court ball, she was equally proud of Edward Waverley. Next morning our hero was awakened by the screaming of the war-pipes outside his bedroom, and Callum Begg, his attendant, informed him that he would have to hurry if he wished to come up with Fergus and Clan Ivor, who had marched out with the prince when the morning was yet grey. Thus spurred, Edward proved himself no laggard. On they went, threading their way through the ranks of the Highland army, now getting mixed up with Bamawapple's horsemen, who, careless of discipline, went spurring through the throng amid the curses of the Highlanders. For the first time Edward saw with astonishment that more than half the clansmen were poorly armed, many with only a scythe on a pole or a sword without a scabbard, while some for a weapon had nothing better than their dirks, or even a stake pulled out of a hedge. Then it was that Edward, who hitherto had only seen the finest and best armed men whom Fergus could place in the field, began to harbor doubts as to whether this unmilitary array could defeat a British army and win the crown of three kingdoms for the young prince with whom he had rashly cast in his lot. But his dismissal and foreboding thoughts were quickly changed to pride when the whole clan Ivor received him with a unanimous shout and the braying of their many war-pipes. Why, said one of a neighboring clan, you greet the young Sackanac as if he were the chief himself. If he be not Bran, he is Bran's brother, replied Evan Dhu, who was now very grand of the name of Ensign Macombich. Oh, then, replied the other, that will doubtless be the young English Duny vassal who is to be married to Lady Flora. That may or may not be, retorted Evan grimly. It is no matter of yours or mine, Gregor. The march continued first by the shore toward Musselburgh, and then along the top of a little hill which looked out seaward, 
While marching thus, news came that Bradwardine's horse had a skirmish with the enemy and had sent in some prisoners. Almost at the same moment from a sort of stone shed called a sheep smearing house, Edward heard a voice which, as if in agony, tried to repeat snatches of the Lord's Prayer. He stopped. It seemed as if he knew that voice. He entered and found in the corner a wounded man lying very near to death. It was no other than Houghton, the sergeant of his own troop to whom he had written to send him the books. At first he did not recognize Edward in his highland dress, but as soon as he was assured that it really was his master who stood beside him, he moaned out, Oh, why did you leave us, squire? Then, in broken accents, he told how a certain peddler called Ruffin had shown him letters from Edward advising them to rise in mutiny. Ruffin, said Edward, I know nothing of any such man. You have been vilely imposed upon, Houghton. Indeed, said the dying man. I often thought so since, and we did not believe till he showed us your very seal. So Tim's was shot and I was reduced to the ranks. Not long after uttering these words, poor Houghton breathed his last, praying his young master to be kind to his old father and mother at Waverley Honor and not to fight with these wild petticoat men against old England. The words cut Edward to the heart, but there was no time for sentiment or regret. The army of the prince was fast approaching the foe. The English regiments came marching out to meet them along the open shore while the Highlanders took their station on the higher ground to the south. But a morass separated combatants, and though several skirmishes took place on the flanks, the main fighting had to be put off till another day. That night, both sides slept on their arms, Fergus and Waverley joining their plaids to make a couch on which they lay with Callum Beg watching at their heads. Before three, they were summoned to the presence of the prince. They found him giving his final directions to the chiefs. A guide had been found who would guide the army across the morass. They would then turn the enemy's flank, and after that the Highland Yell and the Highland Claymore must do the rest. The mist of the morning was still rolling thick through the hollow between the armies when Clan Ivor got the word to charge. Prestepens was no midnight surprise. The English army, regularly ranked, stood ready and waiting. But their cavalry, suddenly giving way, proved themselves quite unable to withstand the furious onslaught of the Highlanders. Edward charged with the others and was soon in the thickest of the fray. It happened that while fighting on the battle line he was able to save the life of a distinguished English officer, who, with the hilt of his broken sword yet in his hand, stood by the artillery from which the gunners had run away, disdaining fight and waiting for death. The victory of the Highlanders was complete. Edward even saw his old commander, Colonel Gardiner, struck down, yet was powerless to save him. But long after, the reproach in the eyes of the dying soldier haunted him, yet it expressed more sorrow than anger. Sorrow to see him in such a place, and in such a dress. But this was soon forgotten when the prisoner he had taken, and whom the policy of the prince committed to his care and custody, declared himself as none other than Colonel Talbot, his uncle's dearest and most intimate friend. He informed Waverley that on his return from abroad he had found both Sir Everard and his brother in custody on account of Edward's reported treason. He had therefore immediately started for Scotland to endeavour to bring back the truant. He had seen Colonel Gardiner, and had found him, after having made a less hasty inquiry into the mutiny of Edward's troop, much softened toward the young man. All would have come right, concluded Colonel Talbot, had it not been for our heroes joining openly with the rebels in their mad venture. Edward was smitten to the heart when he heard of his uncle's sufferings, believing that they were on his account, but he was somewhat comforted when Colonel Talbot told him that, through his influence, Sir Everard had been allowed out under heavy bail, and that Richard Waverley was with him at Waverley Honour. Yet more torn with remorse was Edward when, having once more arrived in Edinburgh, he found at last the leather valise which contained the packet of letters Alice Bean Lane had placed among his linen. From these he learned that Colonel Gardiner had thrice written to him, once indeed sending the letter by one of the men of Edward's own troop, who had been instructed by the peddler to go back and tell the colonel that his officer had received them in person. Instead of being delivered to Waverley, the letters had been given to a certain Mr. William Ruffin, or Riven, or Ruthven, whom Waverley saw at once could be none other 
than Donald being lean himself. Then, all at once remembering the business of the robber cave, he understood the loss of his seal, and, for Houghton's dying reproach, that he should not have left the lads of his troop so long by themselves. Edward now clearly saw how, in a moment of weakness, he had made a great and fatal mistake by joining with the Jacobites. But his sense of honor was such that, in spite of all Colonel Talbot could say, he could not go back on his word. His own hastiness, the clever wiles of Fergus MacIver, Flora's beauty, and most of all the rascality of Donald Bean Lean, had indeed brought his neck, as old Major Melville had prophesied, within the compass of the hangman's rope. The best Edward could do now was to send a young soldier of his troop who had been taken a precipice to his uncle and his father with letters explaining all the circumstances. By Colonel Talbot's advice and help, this messenger was sent aboard one of the English vessels cruising in the Firth, well furnished with passes which would carry him all the way in safety to Waverley Honor. Still, the days went by and nothing was done. Still the prince halted in Edinburgh and waited for reinforcement which never came. He was always hopeful that more clans would declare for him or that other forces would be raised in the lowlands or in England. And meanwhile, chiefly because in the city there was nothing for them to do, plans and plots were being formed. Quarrelings and jealousies became the order of the day among the troops of the White Cockade. One morning... Fergus MacIver came into Edward's lodgings, furious with anger because the prince had refused him two requests, one, to make good his right to be an earl, the other, to give his consent to his marriage with Rose Bradwardine. Fergus must wait for the first, the prince had told him, because that would offend a chief of his own name and of greater power who was still hesitating whether or not to declare for King James. As for Rose Bradwardine, neither must he think of her. Her affections were already engaged. The prince knew this privately, and, indeed, had promised already to favor the match upon which her heart was set. As for Edward himself, he began this time to think less and less of the cruelty of Flora MacIver. He could not have the moon, that was clear, and he was not a child to go on crying for it. It was evident, also, that Rose Bradwardine liked him and marked her favor, and her desire to be with him had their effect upon a heart still sore from Flora's repeated and haughty rejections. One of the last things Edward was able to do in Edinburgh was to obtain from the prince the release of Colonel Talbot, whom he saw safely on his way to London from the port of Leith. After that, it was an actual relief that Edward found the period of waiting in Edinburgh at last at an end, and the prince's army to the number of six thousand men marching southward into England. All was now to be hazarded on the success of a bold push for London. The Highlanders easily escaped a superior army and camped on the borders. They attacked and took Carlisle on their way, and at first it seemed as if they had a clear path to the capital before them. Fergus, who marched with his clan in the van of the prince's army, never questioned their success for a moment, but Edward's clearer eye and greater knowledge of the odds made no such mistake. He saw that few joined them, and those men of no great weight, while all the time the forces of King George were daily increasing. Difficulties of every kind arose about them the farther they marched from their native land, added to which there were quarrels and dissensions among the prince's followers, those between his Irish officers and such highland chiefs as Fergus being especially bitter. Even to Edward, Fergus became fierce and sullen, quite unlike his former gay and confident self. It was about Flora that the quarrel, long smouldering, finally broke into flame. As they passed this and that county seat, Fergus would always ask if the house were as large as Waverley Honor, and whether the estate or the deer park were of equal size. Edward had usually to reply that they were not nearly so great, whereupon Fergus would remark that in that case Flora would be a happy woman. But, said Waverley, who tired of the implied obligation, you forget Miss Flora has refused me not once but many times. I am therefore reluctantly compelled to resign all claims upon her hand. At this, Fergus thought fit to take offence, saying that having once made application for Flora's hand, Waverley had no right to withdraw from his offer without the consent of her guardian. Edward replied that so far as he was concerned, the matter was at an end. He would never press himself upon any lady who had repeatedly refused him, whereupon, 
Fergus turned away furiously, and the quarrel was made. Edward betook himself to the camp of his old friend the Baron, and as he remembered the instruction he had received in the Dragoons, he became easily a leader and a great favorite among the lowland cavalry which followed the old soldier Bradwardine. But he had left seeds of bitter anger behind him in the camp of the proud clan he had quitted. Some of the lowland officers warned him of his danger, and Evan Dhu, the chief's foster brother, who had ever since the visit to the cave had taken a liking to Edward, waited for him secretly in a shady place and bade him beware. The truth was that the clan MacIver had taken it into their heads that Edward had somehow slighted their Lady Flora. They saw that the chief's brow was dark against Edward, and therefore he became all at once fair game for a bullet or a stab in the dark. And the first of these was not long in arriving. And here, I concluded, is the end of the fifth tale. Oh, go on, go on, oh, go on, shouted all four listeners in chorus. We don't want to play or talk just now. We want to know what happened. Very well, then, said I. Then the next story shall be called Black Looks and Bright Swords. Carrying out which resolve, we proceeded at once to the telling of. It was in the dusk of an avenue that Evan Dew had warned Waverley to beware, and ere he had reached the end of the long double line of trees, a pistol cracked in the covert, and a bullet whistled close past his ear. There he is, cried Edward's attendant, a stout merceman of the baron's troop. It's that devil's brat, Callum Begg. And Edward, looking through the trees, could make out a figure running hastily in the direction of the camp of the MacIvers. Instantly, Waverley turned his horse and rode straight up to Fergus. Colonel MacIver, he said, without any attempt at salutation, I have to inform you that one of your followers has just attempted to murder me by firing upon me from a lurking place. Indeed, said the chief haughtily. Well, as that, save in the matter of the lurking place, is a pleasure I presently propose for myself. I should be glad to know which of my clansmen has dared to anticipate me. I am at your service when you will, sir, said Edward, with equal pride. But in the meantime, the culprit was your page, Callum Begg. Stand forth, Callum Begg, cried Vicky and Vor. Did you fire at Mr. Waverley? No, said the unblushing Callum. You did, broke in Edward's attendant. I saw you as plain as ever I saw Cluttingham Kirk. You lie, returned Callum, not at all put out by the accusation. But the chief demanded Callum's pistol. The hammer was down, the pan and muzzle were black with smoke, the barrel yet warm. It had that moment been fired. Take that, cried the chief, striking the boy full on the head with the metal butt. Take that for daring to act without orders and then lying to disguise it. Callum made not the slightest attempt to escape the blow and fell as if he had been slain on the spot. And now, Mr. Waverley, said the chief, be good enough to turn your horse twenty yards with me out upon the common. I have a word to say to you. Edward did so, and as soon as they were alone, Fergus fiercely charged him with having thrown aside his sister Flora in order to pay his court to Rose Bradwardine, whom, as he knew, Fergus had chosen for his own bride. It was the prince, the prince himself who told me, added Fergus, noticing the astonishment on Edward's face. Did the prince tell you that I was engaged to Miss Rose Bradwardine? cried Edward. He did. This very morning, shouted Fergus. He gave it as a reason for a second time refusing my request. So draw and defend yourself, or resign once and forever all claims to the lady. In such a matter I will not be dictated to by you or any living man, retorted Waverley, growing angry in his turn. In a moment swords were out and a fierce combat was beginning, when a number of Bradwardine's cavalry, who being lowlanders were always at feud with the highland men, rode hastily up, calling on their companions to follow. They had heard that there was a chance of a fight between their corps and the Highlanders. Nothing would have pleased them better. The Baron himself threatened that unless the MacIvers returned to their ranks, he would charge them, while they, on their side, pointed their guns at him and his lowland cavalry. A cry that the prince was approaching alone prevented bloodshed. The Highlanders returned to their places. The cavalry dressed its ranks. It was indeed the Chevalier who arrived. His first act was to get one of his French officers, Count of Beaujou, to set the regiment of MacIvers and the lowland cavalry again upon the road. 
He knew that the Count's broken English would put them all in better humor while he himself remained to make the peace between Fergus and Waverley. Outwardly, the quarrel was soon made up. Edward explained that he had no claims whatever to be considered as engaged to Rose Bradwardine or anyone else, while Fergus sulkily agreed that it was possible he had made a mistake. The prince made them shake hands, which they did with the air of two dogs, whom only the presence of the master kept from flying at each other's throats. Then, after calming the clan MacIver and riding a while with the baron's lowland cavalry, the prince returned to the Count of Beaujou, saying with a sigh as he reined his charger beside him, Ah, my friend, believe me, this business of Prince Errant is no bed of roses. It was not long before the poor prince had a further proof of this fact. On the 5th of December, after a council at Derby, the Highland chiefs, disappointed that the country did not rally all about them, and that the government forces were steadily increasing on all sides, compelled the prince to fall back towards Scotland. Fergus MacIver fiercely led the opposition to any retreat. He would win the throne for his prince, or if he could not, then he and every son of Ivor would lay down their lives. That was his clear and simple plan of campaign. But he was easily overborne by the numbers, and when he found himself defeated in council, he shed actual tears of grief and mortification. From that moment, Vicky and Vor was an altered man. Since the day of the quarrel, Edward had seen nothing of him. It was therefore with great surprise that he saw Fergus one evening enter his lodgings and invite him to take a walk with him. The chieftain smiled sadly as he saw his old friend take down his sword and buckle it on. There was a great change in the appearance of Vicky and Vor. His cheek was hollow, his eye burned as if with fever. As soon as the two men had reached a beautiful and solitary glen, Fergus began to tell Edward that he had found out how wrong-headed and rash he had been in the matter of their quarrel. Flora writes me, continued Fergus, that she never had and never could have the least intention of giving you any encouragement. I acted hastily, like a madman. Waverley hastily entreated him to let all be forgotten, and the two comrades in arms shook hands and this time heartily and sincerely. Notwithstanding, the gloom on the chief's brow was scarcely lightened. He even besought Waverley to betake himself at once out of the kingdom by any eastern port to marry Rose Bradwardine and to take Flora with him as a companion to Rose and also for her own protection. Edward was astonished at this complete change in Fergus. What? he cried. Abandon the expedition on which we have all embarked? Embarked, answered the chief bitterly. Why, man? The expedition is going to pieces. It's time for all those who can to get ashore in the longboat. And what, said Edward, are the other Highland chiefs going to do? Oh, the chiefs, said Fergus contemptuously. They think that all the heading and hanging will, as before, fall to the lot of the lowlands, and that they will be left alone in their poor and barren highlands to listen to the wind on the hill till the waters abate. But they will be disappointed. The government will make sure work this time, and leave not a clan in all the highlands able to do them hurt. As for me, it will not matter. I shall either be dead or taken by this time tomorrow. I have seen the Bladock class, the grey spectre. Edward looked the surprise he could not speak. Why, continued Fergus in a low voice, were you so long about Glenachiac and yet never heard of the Bladock cause? The story is well known to every son of Ivor. I will tell it to you in a word. My forefather, Ian Nan Chisto, wasted part of England along with a lowland chief named Halbert Hall. After passing the Shevets on their way back, they quarreled about dividing of the spoil, and from words came speedily to blows. In the fight, the lowlanders were cut off to the last man, and their leader fell to my ancestor's sword. But ever since that day, the dead man's spirit has crossed the chief of Clan Ivor on the eve of any great disaster. My father saw him twice, once before he was taken prisoner at Sheriff Muir, and once again on the morning of the day on which he died. Edward cried out against any such superstition. How can you, he said, you who have seen the world believe such child's nonsense as that? Listen, said the chief, here are the facts and you can judge for yourself. 
Last night I could not sleep for thinking on the downfall of all my hopes for the cause, for the prince, for the clan. So, after lying long awake, I stepped out into the frosty air. I had crossed a small footbridge and was walking backward and forward when I saw clear before me in the moonlight a tall man wrapped in a grey plaid such as the shepherds wear. The figure kept regularly about four yards from me. That is an easy riddle, exclaimed Edward. Why, my dear Fergus, what you saw was no more than a Cumberland peasant in his ordinary dress. So I thought at first, answered Fergus, and I was astonished at the man's audacity in daring to dog me. I called to him but got no answer. I felt my heart beating quickly, and, to find out what I was afraid of, I turned and faced first north, then south, east, and west. Each way I turned, I saw the grey figure before my eyes at precisely the same distance. Then I knew I had seen the buttock glass. My hair stood up, and so strong an impression of awe came upon me that I resolved to return to my quarters. As I went, the spirit glided steadily before me till we came to the narrow bridge where it turned and stood waiting for me. I could not wade the stream. I could not bring myself to turn back. So, making the sign of the cross, I drew my sword and cried aloud, In the name of God, evil spirit, give place. Vicky and Vor, it said in a dreadful voice, Beware of tomorrow. It was then within a half a yard of my sword's point, but, as the words were uttered, it was gone. There was nothing either on the bridge or on the way home. All is over. I am doomed. I have seen the buttock glass. The curse of my house. Edward could think of nothing to say in reply. His friend's belief in the reality of the vision was too strong. He could only ask to be allowed to march once more with the sons of Ivor who occupied the post of danger in the rear. Edward easily obtained the baron's leave to do so, and when the clan MacIver entered the village he joined them, once more arm in arm with their chieftain. At the sight, all the MacIver's ill feeling was blown away in a moment. Heaven do received him with a grin of pleasure, and the imp Callum, with a great patch on his head, appeared particularly delighted to see him. But Waverley's stay with the clan Ivor was not to be long. The enemy was continually harassing their flanks, and the rear guard had to keep lining hedges and dikes in order to beat them off. Night was already falling on the day which Fergus had foretold would be his last, when in a chance skirmish of outposts, the chief and a few followers, found himself surrounded by a strong attacking force of dragoons. A swift eddy of the battle threw Edward out to one side. The cloud of night lifted, and he saw Evan Dew and a few others, with the chieftain in their midst, desperately defending themselves against a large number of dragoons who were hewing at them with their swords. It was quite impossible for Waverley to break through to their assistance. Night shut down immediately, and he found it was equally impossible for him to rejoin the retreating Highlanders, whose war pipes he could still hear in the distance. The buttock glass held the children. The brilliant shine of the high garden in which they had listened to the tale became instantly palest moonlight, and between them and the strawberry bed they saw the filmy plaid of the grey spectre of the house of Ivor. It had been helpful and even laudable to play-act the chief scenes when the story was beginning, but now they had no time. It would have been an insult to the interest of the narrative. Doubtless, if they had had the book, they would have skipped to know how it all ended. But it was time for the evening walk. So, instead of stringing themselves out along the way as was their custom, seeing if the raspberry bushes had grown any taller since the morning, the four collected in a close swarm about the tale-teller, like bees about an emigrant queen. You must tell us the rest, you must, they said linking arms about my waist to prevent any attempt at an evasion of such just demands. So, being secretly no little pleased with their eagerness, I launched out upon the conclusion of the whole matter, which showed, among other things, how Waverly Honour was more honoured than ever, and the blessed bear of Bradwardine threefold blessed. After wandering about for some time, Edward came unexpectedly upon a hamlet. Lights gleamed down the street, and Edward could hear loud voices and the tramp of horses. The sound of shouted orders and soldiers' oaths soon told him that he was in great danger, for these were English troops, and 
If they caught him in his MacIver tartan, they would surely give him short shrift and a swift bullet. Lingering a moment uncertainly near the gate of a small garden enclosure, he felt himself caught by gentle hands and drawn toward a house. Come, Ned, said a low voice. The dragoons are down in the village, and they will do thee a mischief. Come with me into Father's. Judging this to be very much to the purpose, Edward followed, but when the girl saw the tall figure in tartans instead of the sweetheart she had expected, she dropped the candle she had lighted and called out for her father. A stout Westmoreland peasant at once appeared, poker in hand, and presently Edward found himself not ill-received, by the daughter on account of a likeness to her lover, so she said, and by the father because of a certain weakness for the losing side. So, in the house of Farmer Jopson, Edward slept soundly that night, in spite of the dangers which surrounded him on every side. In the morning, the true Edward, whose name turned out to be Ned Williams, was called in to consult with father and daughter. It seemed impossible for Edward to go north to rejoin the prince's forces. They had evacuated Penrith and marched away toward Carlisle. The whole intervening country was covered by scouting parties of government horsemen. Whereupon Ned Williams, who wished above all things to rid the house of his handsome namesake, lest his sweetheart, Cicely, should make other mistakes, offered to get Waverley a change of clothes and to conduct him to his father's farm near Ulswater. Neither old Jopson nor his daughter would accept a farthing of money for saving Waverley's life. A hearty handshake paid one, a kiss the other. And so it was not long before Ned Williams was introducing our hero to his family in the character of a young clergyman who was detained in the north by the unsettled state of the country. On their way into Cumberland, they passed the field of battle where Edward had lost sight of Fergus. Many bodies still lay upon the face of the moorland, but that of Vicky and Vor was not among them. And Edward passed on with some hope that, in spite of the buttock glass, Fergus might have escaped his doom. They found Callum Beg, however, his tough skull cloven at last by a dragoon sword, but there was no sign of either Evan or his chieftain. In the secure shelter of good farmer Williams's house among the hills, it was Edward's lot to remain somewhat longer than he had intended. In the first place, it was wholly impossible to move for ten days owing to a great fall of snow. Then he heard how that the prince had retreated farther into Scotland, how Carlisle had been besieged and taken by the English, and that the whole north was covered by the hosts of the Duke of Cumberland and General Wade. But in the month of January it happened that the clergyman who came to perform the ceremony at the wedding of Ned Williams and Cicely Jopson brought with him a newspaper which he showed to Edward. In it, Waverley read with astonishment a notice of his father's death in London, and of the approaching trial of Sir Everard for high treason, unless, said the report, Edward Waverley, son of the late Richard Waverley and heir to the baronet, should in the meantime surrender himself to justice. It was with an achingly anxious heart that Waverley set out by the northern diligence for London. He found himself in the vehicle opposite to an officer's wife, one Mrs. Nosebag, who tormented him all the way with questions, on several occasions almost finding him out, and once at least narrowly escaping giving him an introduction to a recruiting sergeant of his own regiment. However, in spite of all risks, he arrived safely under Colonel Talbot's roof, where he found that, though the news of his father's death was indeed true, yet his own conduct certainly had nothing to do with the matter, nor was Sir Everard in the slightest present danger. Whereupon, much relieved as to his family, Edward proclaimed his intention of returning to Scotland as soon as possible, not indeed to join with the rebels again, but for the purpose of seeking out Rose Bradwardine and conducting her to a place of safety. It was not perhaps the wisest course he might have pursued, but during his lonely stay at Farmer Williams's farm Edward's heart had turned often and much to Rose. He could not bear to think of her alone and without protection. By means of a passport, which had been obtained for one Frank Stanley, Colonel Talbot's nephew, Waverley was able easily to reach Edinburgh. Here, from the landlady with whom he and Fergus had lodged, Edward first heard the dread news of Culloden, the slaughter of the clans, the flight of the prince, and worst of all, how Fergus and Evan Dhu, captured the night of the skirmish, were presently on trial for their lives at Carlisle. Flora was also in Carlisle, awaiting the issue of the trial, 
while with less certainty Rose Bradwardine was reported to have gone back to her father's mansion of Tully Vailman. Concerning the brave old baron himself, Edward could get no news, save that he had fought most stoutly at Culloden, but that the government were particularly bitter against him because he had been out twice, that is, he had taken part both in the first rising of the year 1715 and also in that which had just been put down in blood at Culloden. Without a moment's hesitation, Edward set off for Tully Vale, and after one or two adventures he arrived there, only to find the white tents of a military encampment whitening the moor above the village. The house itself had been sacked. Parts of the stables had been burned, while the only living being left about the mansion of Tully Vale was no other than poor Davy Gelatley, who, chanting his foolish songs as usual, greeted Edward with the cheering intelligence that, Ah, we're dead and gain. Baron Bailey Saunders Saunderson and Lady Rose that sang a sweet. However, it was not long before he set off at full speed, motioning Waverley to follow him. The innocent took a difficult and dangerous path along the sides of a deep glen, holding on to bushes, rounding perilous corners of rock, till at last the barking dogs directed them to the entrance of a wretched hovel. Here, Davy's mother received Edward with a sullen fierceness which the young man could not understand, till from behind the door, holding a pistol in his hand, unwashed, gaunt, and with a three weeks beard fringing his hollow cheeks, he saw come forth the Baron of Bradwardine himself. After the first gladsome greetings were over, the old man had many a tale to tell his young English friend. But his chief grievance was not his danger of the gallows, nor the discomfort of his hiding place, but the evil doing of his cousin, to whom, as it now appeared, the barony of Bradwardine now belonged. Malcolm of Inchgrabbit had, it appeared, come to uplift the rents of the barony. But the country people, being naturally indignant that he should have so readily taken advantage of the misfortune of his kinsman, received him but ill. Indeed, a shot was fired at the new proprietor by some unknown marksman in the gloaming, which so frightened the air that he fled at once to Stirling, and, had the estate promptly advertised for sale. In addition to which, continued the old man, though I bred him up from a boy, he hath spoken much against me to the great folk of the time, so that they have sent a company of soldiers down here to destroy all that belongs to me, and to hunt his own blood kin like a partridge upon the mountains. Aye, cried Janet gelatly, and if it's not been for my poor Davy there, they would have catched the partridge too. Then, with a true mother's pride, Janet told the story of how the poor innocent had saved his master. The baron was compelled by the strictness of the watch to hide all day and most of the nights in a cave high up in the wooded glen. A comfortable enough place, the old woman explained, for the goodman of course Clore had filled it with straw, but his honor tires of it and he comes down here whiles for a warm at the fire or at times asleep between the blankets. But once, when he was going back in the dawn, two of the English soldiers got a glimpse of him as he was slipping into the wood and banged off a gun at him. I was out on them like a hawk, crying if they wanted to murder a poor woman's innocent bairn, whereupon they swore down my throat that they had seen the old rebel himself, as they called the baron. But my Davy, that some folk take for a simpleton, being in the wood, caught up the old grey cloak that his honour had dropped to run the quicker, and came out from among the trees as if he were speaking, majoring, and play-acting, so like his honour that the soldiermen were clean beguiled, and even gave me a sixpence to say nothing about having there let off a gun at poor crack pain Sawney, as they named my Davy. It was not till this long tale was ended that Waverley heard what he had come so far to find out, that Rose was safe in a house of a Whig laird, an old friend of her father's, and that the bailey, who had early left the army of the prince, was trying his best to save something out of the wreck for her. The next morning Edward went off to call on Bailey Macweeble. At first the man of law was not very pleased to see him, but when he learned that Waverley meant to ask Rose to be his wife, he flung his best wig out of the window and danced a highland fling for very joy. This rejoicing was a little marred by the fact that Waverley was still under prescription. But when a messenger of the Baileys had returned from the nearest post town with a letter from Colonel Talbot, all fear on this account was put at an end. Colonel Talbot had, though with the greatest difficulty, obtained royal protections for both the Baron of Bradwardine and for Edward himself. There was no doubt that full pardons would follow in due course. 
Right thankfully the baron descended from his cave as soon as Edward carried him the good news, and with Davy Gillatley and his mother all went down to the house of Bailey MacWeeble where supper was immediately served. It was from old Janet Gillatley, Davy's mother, that Waverley learned whom he had to thank for rescuing him from the hands of Captain Gifted Gilfillian, and to whom the gentle voice belonged which had cheered him during his illness. It was none other than Rose Bradwardine herself. To her, Edward owed all. She had even given up her jewels to Donald Bean Lean so that he might go scathless. She, it was, who had provided a nurse for him in the person of old Janet Gillatley herself, and lastly, she had seen him safely on his way to Holyrood under the escort of the sulky Laird of Bamoabel. So great kindness certainly required very special thanks, and Edward was not backward in asking the Baron for permission to accompany him to the house of Duckran where Rose was at present residing. So well did Edward express his gratitude to Rose that she consented to give all her life into his hands, that he might go on showing how thankful he was. Of course, the marriage could not take place for some time, because the full pardons of the Baron and Edward took time to obtain. For Fergus MacIver, alas, no pardon was possible. He and Evan Dew were condemned to be executed for high treason at Carlisle, and all that Edward could do was only to promise the condemned chieftain that he would be kind to the poor clansmen of Vicky and Vore for the sake of his friend. As for Evan Dew, he might have escaped. The judge went the length of offering to show mercy if Evan would only ask it. But when Evan Dew was called upon to plead before the court, his only request was that he might be permitted to go down to Klenikiak and bring up six men to be hanged in the place of Vicky and Vor. And, he said, you may begin with me the first man. At this, there was a laugh in the court. But Evan, looking about him sternly, added, if the Saxon gentlemen are laughing because a poor man such as me thinks my life or the life of any six of my degree is worth that of Vicky and Vore, they may be very right. But if they laugh because they think that I would not keep my word and come back to redeem him, I can tell them that they can neither the heart of a highlandman nor the honor of a gentleman. After these words, there was no more laughing in that court. Nothing now could save Fergus MacIver. The government will resolved on his death as an example and both he and Evan were accordingly executed, along with many others of the unhappy garrison of Carlisle. Edward and Rose were married from the house of Dacran some days after they started, according to the custom of the time, to spend some time upon an estate which Colonel Talbot had bought, as was reported, a very great bargain. The baron had been persuaded to accompany them, taking a place of honor in their splendid coach, and six the gift of Sir Everard. The coach of Mr. Rubric of Dockeran came next, full of ladies, and many gentlemen on horseback rode with them as an escort to see them well on their way. At the turning of the road which led to Tully Vale in, the bailey met them. He requested the party to turn aside and accept of his hospitality at his house of Little Vale in. The baron, somewhat put out, replied that he and his son-in-law would ride that way, but they would not bring upon him the whole matrimonial procession. It was clear, however, that the baron rather dreaded visiting the ancient home of his ancestors, which had been so lately sold by the unworthy Malcolm of Inchgrabbit into the hands of a stranger. But as the bailey insisted, and as the party evidently wished to accept, he could not hold out. When the baron arrived at the avenue, he fell into a melancholy meditation, thinking doubtless of the days when he had taken such pride in the ancient barony, which had passed for ever away from the line of Bradwardines. From these bitter thoughts, he was awakened by the sight of two huge stone bears which had been replaced over the gateposts. Then down the avenue came the two great deerhounds, Ban and Busker, which had so long kept their master company in his solitude with daft Davy Gelatly dancing behind them. The baron was then informed that the present owner of the barony was no other than Colonel Talbot himself, but that if he did not care to visit the new owner of Bradwardine, the party would proceed to Little Vale in the house of Bailey MacWeeble. Then, indeed, the baron had need of all his greatness of mind, but he drew a long breath, took snuff abundantly, and remarked that as they had brought him so far he would not pass the colonel's gate, and that he would be happy to see the new master of his tenants. When he alighted in front of the castle, the baron was astonished to find how swiftly the marks of spoilation had been removed. Even the roots of the felled trees had disappeared. All was fair and new about the house of Tully Valen, 
even to the bright colors of the garb of Davy Gelatly, who ran first to one, then the other of the company, passing his hands over his new clothes and crying, Bra, bra, Davy! The dogs, Bran and Busker, leaping upon him, brought tears into the baron's eyes, even more than the kind welcome of Colonel Talbot's wife, the Lady Emily. Still more astonishing appeared the changes in the so lately ruined courtyard. The burned stables had been rebuilt upon a newer and better plan. The pigeon house was restocked and the populace with fluttering wings. Even the smallest details of the garden and the multitude of stone bears on the gables had all been carefully restored as of old. The baron could hardly believe his eyes, and he marveled aloud that Colonel Talbot had not thought fit to replace the Bradwardine arms with his own. But here the colonel, suddenly losing patience, declared that he would not, even to please these foolish boys, Waverley and Frank Stanley, and his own foolish wife, continue to oppose upon another old soldier. So, without more ado, he told the baron that he had only advanced the money to buy back the barony, and that he would leave Bailey Macweeble to explain to whom the estate really belonged. Trembling with eagerness, the Bailey advanced, a formidable roll of papers in his hand. He began triumphantly to explain that Colonel Talbot had indeed bought Bradwardine, but that he had immediately exchanged it for Brerwood Lodge, which had been left to Edward under his father's will. Bradwardine had therefore returned to its ancient lord in full and undisputed possession, and the baron was once more master of all his hereditary powers, subject only to an easy yearly payment to his son-in-law. Tears were actually in the old gentleman's eyes as he went from room to room so that he could scarce speak a word of welcome either to the guests within or of thanks to the rejoicing farmers and cotters who, hearing of his return, had gathered without. The climax of his joy, however, reached when the blessed bear of Bradwardine itself, the golden cup of his line, mysteriously recovered out of the spoil of the English army by Frank Stanley, was brought to the baron's elbow by old Saunders Saunderson. Truth to tell, the recovery of this heirloom afforded the old man almost as much pleasure as the regaining of his barony, and there is little doubt that a tear mingled with the wine as, holding the blessed bear in his hand, the baron solemnly proposed the healths of the united families of Waverley Honor and Bradwardine. And that is it, the end of this story of Waverley, a tale that you know, it's so large in literature and which honestly I had never read before. And I, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it a lot. And I do, I do hope that you did as well. This is Dan Scholes for the Folktale Project. Don't forget that you can subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Play, Overcast, anywhere you like to get your podcasts. You can follow us on Twitter at Folktale Project. You can find us on Auto Radio, TuneIn Radio, iHeartRadio, Spotify, anywhere you like to listen. And you can always head over to folktaleproject.com. You'll find a new story waiting for you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And please, if you enjoyed this tale or just enjoy the program, please head over to Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen and leave a rating and a review. I appreciate it. As always, thank you so much for listening.